Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring the topics of music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. This week, I'm joined by technology trainer and speaker, Katie Wardrobe. But when I do like the little thing before the conversation cues in, is there any, like you'll notice I left this blank here. Like how, what is like the one sentence way that you <laughs> identify yourself and yeah, prefer to be? You know, I keep changing it as well. <laughs> like I've even changed it on my own podcast. <laughs> like I change, right. I change it every couple of weeks. I'm like, nah, I don't feel like that's quite right either. But what do I normally say? Education, uh, technology trainer and speaker. That's probably really it. <laughs> it's so boring sounding like. But accurate. Coach, a tech coach. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I do keep changing it. I think um, about this a lot. My website says percussionist, music educator, blank. And like I play with the technology, like the technology, like I have, having a book about technology and like writing about it and having a podcast makes me feel like something should be there. And I yeah, sort of, yeah. in a cheeky way on Twitter, I call myself a technology hype man, but that's, it <laughs> feels like selling it a little short, but I also don't know that there's a word really for. No. And, and when, when people introduce me, they'll say technology expert, but I don't like that really because I'm not an expert in all the things. Like I, I just know what I know, or I know enough about things, or I'm one step ahead of whoever I'm training or whatever it is. So, I mean, maybe that's true compared. It's all relative, isn't it? You know? Compared to so, the yeah. average teacher, maybe yes. But then, I have technologist is another thing I've been called before, and I don't know why. <laughs> but that doesn't seem like something I should no. be called. <laughs> it sounds like you're in a white coat in a lab or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> Te- technology enthusiast, like lots of people are that. So I don't know. I yeah. yeah. Well, if you figure that out, let me know. I'll, I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this is one of the things that I feel like is worth acknowledging as far as like speaking topically, like what, what are the things we want to talk about today? I mean, you are someone who does, I feel like of, of the voices in music education who are like prominent technology voices, I do feel like you are one of the, f- the few voices who like you do have, like there are things that are in your wheelhouse, but then I feel like also you make a lot of effort to be very broad, at least have like a general knowledge of a broad number of technol- technological things. Yes, absolutely. But I and, I and I would not claim to be an expert at certain things. Like I, you know, I I don't have training in audio engineering at all. So I only know enough to get by and enough to teach the average music teacher staff. But the people in that I teach music technology group, those are not people that need my help, generally speaking, because they are already at that level and they just need the pointer of the right name of a software program or you know, go check this YouTube video out. They don't need express help. You know, they're, they're more expert themselves. So, yeah, and I, I don't try to, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't teach Ableton Live because I just don't use it. <laughs> yeah. I'll just send people to someone else. So, yeah. I guess that's a pretty good segue into some somewhat of an introductory topic. So I can't imagine anyone who is aware of and listens to this has not heard of Midnight Music. I mean, like, you... Is that, I mean, definitely now in the past 10 months, if someone already was not aware, they should definitely be aware of your website. It's an amazing resource. You've had a couple of things you've done in particular that have been super viral since COVID, a couple of articles. Like someone has, I can't imagine you're a music teacher and you haven't been to your website, but how do you describe Midnight Music and like what it offers to the music teaching community? Yeah. I, I, and I will just say, I do get messages or tagged on Facebook from people who have said, oh my gosh, I just discovered this Midnight Music website. So, And I don't presume that everybody does know of my website and who I am, but, but it's nice to see that too, because it's a reminder that there's such a, a big number of music teachers out there in a, a big wide world. But yeah, in terms of what I do, really, it's focusing on helping teachers get a handle on technology for their teaching life and you know, I've decided over time I, I kind of ended up distilling it down to different areas because like you and I both know you use technology for your own personal productivity or creating teaching resources and so on and that's one area and then there's the technology that you use with students and that's a different thing altogether 
And even then it can be broken down into you use technology to capture things for the purposes of assessment or archival purposes or tracking digital portfolios, but then you also use technology to create and compose and that side of things. So there's all these kind of different areas, different buckets of uses of technology. So the, the thing I laugh about is when someone asks that question, which is like so broad when they go, I want to get more into technology. Where should I start? <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. Well, how long have you got? <laughs> you know, so yeah, what do you want to achieve? And and sometimes they don't know the answer to that, that well, what do you want to achieve question? And I think that that's where it becomes hard. So so breaking it down into those broader areas can be useful for people. <laughs> I think te- technology can be daunting at times and The thing that I love the most is people who let me know that they've tried something and it might be something really small and it's worked for them and such a thrill to to hear that from people. So that's what keeps me going. (laughs) And your website is, I I love that it is sort of like one of the first things you see when you start scrolling is sort of these sort of like over overreaching sort of I don't, I don't know about like topics but just like clumps that people think of technology in because people t- tend to associate technology with hardware so you have sort of like ipads chromebooks max pcs things that people sort of look at and say that's that's technology so yeah. help, and that's the one that i've just got like 20 of for my classroom so help me that's the one help i want to start there. yeah yeah i have to tell you a funny story about that actually and those um categories so you know you're referring to on the website there's these i think there's six or do we do eight in the end six buttons uh, I see. something six icons <laughs> and they have different different areas so you can click through if you want specifically help with iPads or Chromebooks but then there's ones which are like elementary music and middle slash high school and then like free technology and I I've struggled for years coming up with those categories because they are not categories that match one another if you know what I mean they're not all part of the same overarching broader category they're all kind of different categories, but yes. that was that was in response to what do people come to me? What's the question that they say or, or ask for or help that they're looking for? And it is, oh my gosh, I've got a class set of iPads. What do I do with them? Or I'm an elementary teacher. Where do I start? And so they're they're kind of like there's a lot of crossover in those two. You could have a Venn diagram with a big section in the middle which crosses over that. But those are the questions. So, yes, yeah, so that's what, what I ended up doing on the website. And it follows through into my um, private community as well, where we're currently reorganising stuff to fit into those buckets as well. But, yeah, super hard because it's so broad. It really is so broad. It is. Well, this fits one of the overarching themes of my life involvement with technology. And certainly what I do on this podcast is I, you know, I think I think people who ask that are maybe like, and I understand like that that comes from a place of desperation, especially if you've been thrown into online learning. But that's really not the question. Like the question is, what's the problem I'm trying to solve as a creatively, as an educator and as a musician? And then if you are desperate enough to find, I mean, you'll eventually get to where you're going if you just say, help. But <laughs> I think when you more specifically try to say, like, how do I want to solve this problem? How does this affect my kids? How does this affect my workflow? Then the tools support the actual ends, which are musical, ultimately, and you sort of work from there. But I still think it makes sense to have it organized this way. Because I mean, people do, if they aren't lumping their technological ideology into like a hardware device, they certainly are thinking about like, do I teach elementary school or middle school? Or do I want something free? I think it makes sense that that's one of the six yeah. circles. <laughs> people want yeah. free stuff free stuff i know and i have struggled with that a little bit over the years because i i mean i love the fact that there are free things out there but it's kind of like people deserve to be paid for what they make and what they yep. do and there is an attitude from some people that things should be free there's a you know they have a right to have free access to free things which i don't think is true i love the fact that there are free things because i on the other side of it i also love that there are free things that teachers who don't have a big budget can get access to and therefore they can do some of these things with their students, you know, tech-related things, com- composition, capturing ideas and so on. So I think that's good from that point of view. But, you know, I, it's kind of like you're always going to get better service, better features, you know, with page options. And, you know, people, <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes into even a free app or website, like so much work. 
just to maintain it. I'm sure the app developers, they, you know, they probably just think, oh, no, Google's had another update, you know, so Chrome's had another update. Now their app has to update as well or the app, you know, the Apple iOS ecosystem has an update. Then all the apps have to update too. Like it's just such a nightmare to keep up with all of that. So I admire people who are running free services and, and just getting them going and <laughs> keeping them going. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean... It- the the energy and the time and the money i mean it all has to sort of balance out in the end i mean certainly paid good paid software you, you reminded me of uh, last episode paul well it, let's see to someone who's listening to this this will that will no longer be the most recent episode but anyway my, recently <laughs> paul uh, kafasis from rogue amoeba was on oh, yes. and he yeah i mean and they're and they're like premium mac audio apps you know they are like 50 60 plus dollar apps and yeah that was exactly his his point he's just like you know you have to put food on the table if you want. And he said, we, we aim to make really good apps and then the following will come if they need that. Not, you know, I think sometimes in tech music, well, I won't say in music so much, but definitely in education, we have this sort of expectation where, you know, we're expected to have the resources given to us and teachers already give so many resources, time, energy, and money to get by in their classrooms that I think it's, it makes sense that they want a free thing. But at the end of the day, yeah, the paid thing will often yeah, the, the, the good thing. And do you know what I equate it to? And someone told me this years ago, and I've never forgotten it, and it applies to lots of things in your life where if you're paying money for something, and it can be anything, it could be an app or it could be the services of a person that's going to come and help you, like a, a gardener or a cook or something like that. It, if you, A, don't want to do that thing or don't have the capacity to do that thing or the time, Paying $50 to save you a whole heap of time or to do something that's going to reduce down so many headaches in the long run, like that to me is totally worth it. So, And it's funny because um, the Rogue Amoeba apps, <laughs> Loopback is one of my, oh, you yeah. know, more recent in the last 12 months, say, favourite like life-saving pieces of software that because... And, and for those that are listening who haven't used it or don't know, I mean, it's Mac only, but there's an equivalent black hole, I think. I haven't used it, but for PC users. And, you know, it's a way of internally routing and organising all of your audio stuff. And it just means that you can more easily share, for me, share audio on a YouTube live session in a webinar. I can share the audio from my keynote file, from me speaking, from the YouTube video I need to play, from uh, GarageBand if I've got that open, Chrome Music Lab, and it just makes life so much easier. And it was super easy to set up. It took me like five minutes to set up, and it's done. And that whole headache of like of how to manage audio when you're in particularly in a live situation it was totally worth paying whatever it cost me. I think Australian dollars, because also it's more expensive for us here. So it was $120. I don't know, something like that. hundred bucks. Right. Totally. I would pay it again. <laughs> like, you know, I would yeah, just yeah. happily, you know, like, oh, it's just so good. So for me, paying some money to solve a problem or even uh, it pains me to watch my kids play app, play with apps on their phone and all the adverts pop up and they're like, yeah. oh, hang on. We've got to just wait for this ad to right. run. <laughs> I'm like, right. how much is it to buy the app? And they're like, oh, $3. Oh, my gosh, just press the button and buy the app. <laughs> like, seriously, if it's something that they're using a lot, you know, right. like, please get rid of the ads. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally with you. How you get, you know, I, I always say, like, how you get from point A to point B matters. And it's the same as, as playing a piece of music. Like, <laughs> we've, you, can, you can play two different levels of quality the same. You know, a band can play the same piece of music and you can have two different levels of quality of how you, you know, two different concepts of phrasing, two different t- concepts of intonation. When I'm rerouting my audio around, why would I not want to do, if I can, you know, afford to, why would I not want to, you know, do that in the easiest, most direct way possible? That's kind of oh, how yeah. I think about it. And in, in recent years, particularly, my time has become more and more precious. I'm, I'm a, you know, solo mom with two boys and, you know, managing a household with just one adult in it, it's different to if you've got a couple of adults and time's very precious, running my own business. And so I equate it often to if I pay money, will this save me time? And yes, it will, because not using loopback means that I spend hours of of headache time, (laughs) you know, searching for solutions or troubleshooting or it's just so painful. And so using an app that provides a solution Saves your time, you're done. Just be done with it. So yep. yeah, I, I love it. You mentioned something else too that I that sort of connects to this. 
but I would have brought it up anyway because it's just, it's just interesting to me, this idea that sort of two of the main categories of technology, like there's personal stuff that you can use and then there's student-facing stuff. And I think that as that relates to paid versus free software, you know, I, I was definitely someone who was firmly more knowledgeable about personal, you know, technology that I could run on my own personal devices that I would definitely, like my students would benefit, like I think my students benefit from me having a knowledge of health apps because I'm more healthy and mentally sane when I teach. So I, <laughs> to even, my to-do app, my all of my stuff that I was managing on my own personal machines that I had bought on the app store with my own personal money, like that was affecting my students one way or another, but it was not the same as this growing category of cloud-based student-facing software that's often free or has a a method of like a business model where you probably aren't really going to be getting use out of it unless your district is paying for it anyway. Yeah. And so that's always an interesting distinction because I think, you know, there's things that like music first note flight, learn soundtrack, all of these, these cloud tools that have come out that run in a web browser, you know, these are often things that if you're using them in a classroom, awesome, but teachers are so variable with how, you know, which of those tools they have experience with, and they often don't have control over which ones has, have been decided for them. And that's, and that's why exploring the things that I can control has always been so much more interesting to me in technology. <laughs> yeah, I, I do feel the pain of those that are subject to whatever their district has decided or school. We don't have districts here in Australia so much, not quite like the, the way you do, but, but the school will decide. Or if it's a government school, the, the, the department will decide often for all the schools, you know, what certain things are going to be. So, And I think uh, particularly in the last, you know, what, 12 months or just under now with the whole coronavirus thing, one of the things is the the option that they have for live conference calls, you know, so Zoom versus Google Meet versus Microsoft Teams. I mean, that is usually the thing you have no control over, you know. Mm-hmm. I feel really sorry for those that are on Microsoft Teams if you're a music teacher because you just have fewer options available to you with yeah. all the things, audio especially. But, yeah, it, that's that's really hard and you just got to make do that. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. I I also think that with free, I think that some teachers don't also consider sometimes what's important with free software, what's missing. So, for instance, Soundtrap and Noteflight, for instance, you know, if you take those two, yeah, you can sign up for a free account. You could have all your students sign up for a free account and use them. And, yes, there are limited features, but often teachers forget that when you pay, A, you get more features, but one of the things is the privacy is not in place with the free versions because they are designed for general public you know, regular, in inverted commas, people and not not school students. And so when you pay, you get this awesome ecosystem and you're protected and you get all those features where you can share assignments back and forth with students and so on and see them in your classroom in, in those apps. And I think people really, they just, they don't feel that that's important or they don't realise that that's missing when they're using the free one. And it's probably okay if you're working with older students, maybe, you know, the, the very upper grades, you're 10, 11, 12, that's probably less of an issue. But if you're in middle school and below, you, you really need those paid versions to get that ecosystem and to be legal and, and have the privacy. So protection. The secure, between the security that you're talking about and then the the finance, those have been the two major reasons that my school district has held out on some of these tools. Like we're the main two that we got starting at the beginning of this fall, we've been online since last March and note flight, and Soundtrap have been the two two of the the major financial resources, and and I don't know what changed because I'm pretty sure that the technology because I I had been barking up the street for years before <laughs> this happened, and I, I'm not I don't know that they actually changed their software strategy. Basically, there was a a protocol that we used for all of our to do single sign on between all of our apps. Something would have to use what's called a clever in order to integrate with our Canvas and our Google Doc. Not we don't. Yeah, we do use Google Docs, but we call it something different. We call it like the Google suite of apps. Basically, they, these yeah. are all integrated with Clever. And if a, a service didn't have Clever built into it, we wouldn't be able to use yeah. it because it was lower security. Well, I don't know that NoteFlight or Soundtrap integrate with Clever or if we're just desperate this year, but we eventually we finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I, I feel sorry, actually, in Australia here, there's one of our states, oh man, they just keep moving the goalposts for, for that sort of thing, for approving or not approving certain apps. Actually, Soundtrap often 
like teachers are using it and then one day they just can't use it <laughs> because something's changed in the department and they're like you know what no we've decided no for that one but it doesn't filter down to the teachers until often you're in front of a class and you just can't use it so yeah it's it's not so good oh, hard work very hard work when you're subject to other people's rules <laughs> yeah right right well and it's interesting because i this is when people talk about music education technology these student facing services are some they're a big part of the conversation and i feel like i'm only just now since last march learning to you know to to enter into this to this dialogue and i still am finding at times that you know some things are you know they're out of my control i mean and we can i guess we can i kind of want to maybe come at this in a later topic so we don't have to totally dive into it now but i mean there is this you know connection between paid and free and, and premium and, you know, eh, mediocre apps. There's also this connection to like what runs in a web browser versus like what is a like a truly developed yeah. native app. Like my Zoom experience right now is better because I can run it in an actual app that has control over my system audio, ins yeah. and outs and my video. Whereas Google Meet, which runs in a Chrome tab, yeah. not quite the same experience. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really, it can be really hard. Mm. I don't think we're getting that. That is all to say, I don't believe that I'm going to get a Mac version of either Note Flight or Soundtrap anytime soon. So, I'm, no, <laughs> this is true. Hold my breath. <laughs> or not going to hold my breath, I guess. <laughs> and, and also, just one last thing on that, actually. I've also realized that there's things that I will use for me personally, and then there's the things that, you know, teachers would use with students. I mean, I don't have students, so I can't speak to that personally, but like for notation software, for instance, you know, most people know I'm a Sibelius user. That's what I've just used for all the years. If I'm doing things for myself, notation-wise, I'm using Sibelius. And, and for that reason, I, I prefer the features involved and all the things. But, you know, to be honest, it's overkill for a year eight student. Like, they do not need all the features of Sibelius. So NoFly is a great solution, or Flat, Flat.io. You know, both mm. of those are, are really good options. So, so then it comes down to technology for me versus technology that, you would use in the classroom with students and some teachers don't mind that having you know learning two apps two different apps for them to use personally or for them to use with their students and others kind of like i barely have time to learn one app so and i'm like that's okay if noteflight is working with your students stick with that you can probably do most of what you need to do notation wise for your own work as well give or take so yeah that's that's been my philosophy too as a as a power a user an advocate of power tools but also someone who's a middle school band director like i do have to reconcile the fact that 95 percent of the time i am just writing whole notes in quarter yeah. notes into my yeah. score editor. especially if it's a tuba part you know right. <laughs> i used to i used to in surveillance if i ever had to do like sorry tuba players i'm talking like you know beginner band level stuff but if i ever had to do a tuba part for something I would speed up the tempo in Sibelius, drag that slider to the right and go really fast and record in real time. And mm -hmm. so like, like a whole bar would be tick, 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 tick. Right. <laughs> I would just record all the whole notes really fast. And then I'd slow it down when I had to do the flute part or <laughs> violin. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, well, you, you know, that, that reminds me, this is maybe not on my topic list, but I, I think the last time that we were speaking... I recall you saying that you were really on the verge of trying out StaffPad for... Like, oh, did yeah. You recently I, still, get I, have iPad? Oh, I have not had time to do that. And no, I have not upgraded my iPad. So that's, you know, that that's on the, the card still. That It's been pushed down a little bit because I'm, I'm currently working on this video creation course for music teachers. And my MacBook Pro, so I've got a, a 2018 MacBook Pro, I think is the model. 17? 18. And anyway, it's got 8 gig of RAM, which can't be upgraded because it's a unified, you know, right. RAM, whatever, whatever they call it. And yeah, I'm like, mm, I just need to upgrade a little bit. The MacBook Pro is totally fine for most of what I do. And I will keep that for travel and I want to work on the couch. So I'm going to have my laptop there, you know. But I'm like, mm, I need to upgrade. So the, the iPad's been pushed down the list a little bit, the priority list, because I think I'm going to get a new Mac Mini. Well, a new to me Mac Mini. And I'm currently tossing up whether it's going to be the Intel Mac Mini or the M1 chip, which is not that long out. And I'm leaning towards the Intel one at the moment. But 
we'll see. So the Intel one has more options to go higher in RAM and the Mac mini one looks great. Reports are kind of mostly good on it, but it's a little bit new for me. I'm a little bit averse to, I'm not an early adopter with technology and particularly with operating systems and a Mac mini with the M1 chip, you can only get Big Sur on it. And I'm like, uh-huh. I'm not ready to go there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So it might be the Intel Mac mini, I think, for now. I may upgrade down the, the track, switch it over or something, but yeah. I'm biting my tongue so hard right now. I am, Are you? Oh, come on, talk. <laughs> I'm, I'm steeped so heavily in the. I listen to like five or six different podcasts that are all just Apple commentary yeah Um, i've been watching youtube videos to be honest it's it's super useful because you kind of get the real world view but yeah okay tell me tell me that what should i get i i just really so i i'm a little concerned well no i shouldn't call myself conservative i'm pretty risky i run like the ios beta software on my you know when they release the public beta of the next ios i always install it on at least one device and if it ruins my work it ruins my work like i just i just love to be I just love that the day that it finally is ready, that I know how to use that device because as the people who are actually like in that industry, all the people who write about, you know, that specific tech as, as they are learning these things, I'm also able to try these things. Like even small little features, like I saw on Twitter the other day, someone was like, I just learned that if you take the Apple pencil and you swipe up from the lower left corner of the screen, it takes a quick screenshot and you can annotate it. And I was like, yeah, it's a really cool tip. And I was like, I knew that tip because like I was running the software when that was like fresh hot you know off yeah. the, so i'm so i'm i'm risky and reckless but everything i've read about these m1 max says that the like we're 40 years into personal computers being this sort of thing that they are you know having these sort of like win, the keyboard and mouse graphic user interfaces and you know things are already i mean cell phones are already so iterative that you don't really need to buy a new cell phone every year or two to stay up on the light like yeah. you can let your cell phone go a little while so you don't expect a 40 year old platform to make a year over year jump like this but everything i'm reading is so overwhelmingly enthusiastic about how big the performance jump is i know this is what kills me it's it's and this is why i'm I'm, for it's more than a week now i'm going back and forth between the two so i I am actually going to go into an apple store and, and chat to whoever's there and and see what they think. So, but there are some drawbacks. There's Bluetooth issues. I don't know. I'm yeah. reading all this stuff, and I don't have time to wait because I need it quite urgently for this, you know, recording video stuff for the video course. I, I what I would do in a normal time is wait three months or six months and just let things settle a little bit, let them release a few updates, get the the bugs ironed out, whatever, and then and then get it then. But I'm kind of like I need something now. Uh, it's tough. It's really it tough. tough. It's really they, tough. Are the Mac Minis, the, the Intel ones, cheaper now that the M1 is out? Kind of, but not really if you need to upgrade all the things. So once you click, you know, like you, you're looking at like right. a, a fast food menu. Yes, I'll have that sure. and I'll add that and I'll add that. So if I go higher for all, pretty much for all of the, the options, yeah. And in Australia, man, you know. It just feel. I, I was on the US, I didn't realize, and I was on the Apple website, which was the US one. If you just type in apple.com here, it, it usually defaults to the US website. And sometimes it'll say, hey, it looks like you're in Australia. Do you want to visit the Australian website? And why, yes, I do, because otherwise the prices are not correct. So I'm looking at the US website and I'm putting all the options in. I'm like, okay. That's not so bad. It's just over two grand if I go for all, like a lot of the upper options. And then I went, oh, hang on. Oh, I'm on the US side. And so I clicked the button, switched over, redid all the options. It's more than $3,000 for what I was looking at. <laughs> and that's when I went, mm, maybe I'll just go the Mac Mini. Mm. Anyway, I mean, the, the M1 chip. Yeah. I'll report I, back one day and tell you what I ended up getting. <laughs> I'm I'm really anxious to know now. I just I know that my next <laughs> one, like I think I'm at the, I'm on the verge of like I'm starting to tell that my computer is old, but it's not at a point where I couldn't keep it for a while. Yeah. And you have to like everyone is different. Like I know people who keep Macs around for ten years. I know people who 
like sell by upgrade it every two years and like sell are really comfortable selling stuff and getting good money back for it. I'm like every five, four or five ish years for me. Yeah, but... that's me too. I'm about every four years or so. And sometimes I'm shocked when I look back and go, Oh, I didn't realize I'd had this for so long. And often the turning point, the tip over is, is nearly always to do with video, video editing. So, you know, things start to run slowly. I, you make an edit in a video editing program and then it takes place about four seconds later. You know what I mean? Like it's all just, and it starts to kill you. You, you die a little bit inside every time and it becomes frustrating. And it comes down to what we were saying before about t- saving of time. I'm like, you know what? This is something I use. Every, I live on this. This is my work, my primary work tool and I need a, a decent one. So I know I'm still I am still considering the M1. I haven't decided fully, but you can go up to 16 gig on the the M1 chip. That's the max. You can go if you wanted to. You could go up to 64 on the Intel, but there's the trade off of everything else is kind of faster on the M1 as well. That's what my research has shown me anyway. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Yeah, I think the single core performance is faster on the M1, and I don't always yeah. know how that equates to real life world experience. But my understanding is like something like because I have a 2016 Mac, so I'm really considering if, let's just say that like in the next 12 months, a, you know, MacBook Pro with like an up, you know, whatever's the next generation or like a beefed up version of that, like that, I would jump, I think all over that. So I'm asking the, you know, the question, like, where would I see that difference in performance? And I think it comes down to things like, like that feeling of like editing something, those kind of like snappy responses yeah. are the things that the M1, you would definitely notice improvements with. Yeah. When you press save and there's the rainbow wheel, like yeah, it uh-huh. just drives me nuts. <laughs> it really, and, and it's worrying you, uh, like I'm paranoid about backing up or, you know, so often mm-hmm. because video stuff is obviously you're doing it on your local hard drive. You, you're not doing that through the cloud at all. So y- you need to remember to back up your stuff and, and plug your time machine in and stuff. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, and and that was what I ended up looking up on YouTube, uh, and there was a lot of options to see video reviews from. I, I specifically looked for people who are video editors mm-hmm. and what their review of the M1 chip was, and versus Intel and stuff, because I could care less what the average person who's using it to surf, you know, <laughs> surf the net and, and do regular stuff with. I mean, it's it's all about video and audio, so it was interesting to see their reviews. Uh, and I'll probably still look out for them. There's things popping up all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're reminding me of something I definitely wanted to talk to you about today, which is, you know, you have learned some of this, these professional tools for making stuff because the nature of your website and, you know, the blog posts you make and you know, the podcast you have and, and all of your other teaching resources is like you're doing things with graphics, you're doing things with the web and HTML and you're doing videos and stuff. Like yes. what are some of the tools that you like to use to make stuff? Yes. Oh my gosh. Such a good question. And it's funny because it's all the things that teachers wouldn't see. Well, they see them, but they don't realize that's going on behind the scenes. It's not like they see me using that. You would see me using Sibelius, you know, YouTube video, but how did I make the video? How did I post the video? How did I put it on my website? How did I create the thumbnail image? And it's so funny. I've been saying to my own boys who are teenagers now, you know what, there's a few skills, I think, which are so important to learn in this day and age, which are going to serve you well, whatever job you end up with. And that is video editing and some basic graphic design, like editing of images and and things like that. And also basic HTML. And all of those things I learned on the job, you know, Mm -hmm. literally on the job, because it was out of necessity. You know, I, I started a website back in, oh, it's probably 2008 or so. And my first one was made, do you remember Apple iWeb? Oh, I loved called? iWeb. I loved <laughs> I Apple iWeb. I had an iWeb site for a while. And then I'm like, nah, this is not real. This is very, it was very clunky. And my gosh, web, web design, web, like just building a website, it's so much easier these days, like back in those days. I mean, and probably at that time it was easier than it had been five years previous. But right. You know, back in that time, like you really needed to know HTML, at least understand how it worked. And that took me a long time to learn, like how you don't need to remember HTML code because you can just Google that anytime you need it. But you just need to know the concepts of how it works. And when you look at a web page, there's like the pretty view and then there's the behind the scenes 
text view, which does not look pretty and doesn't look like what it looks like to the public, but that's where you can really get nitty gritty and work out what the hell's going wrong on this page. And oh, there it is. I can see, you know, the HTML has gone a bit wrong or there's extra letters in there. I don't know, something. And learning that was so useful and learning video editing, just general video editing, even just basic stuff. And then the graphic design uh, side of things too. Those three things, honestly, if people learn those, if my boys learn enough about those, there's, you know, most jobs they're going to go into and, or if they want to do something for themselves, they're going to just be in a much better position. And it's funny because as teachers, who would have thought you'd need to know this stuff as a teacher and then yet here we are and particularly in the last, you know, nine months, eight, whatever we're up to now, <laughs> like lockdown periods and stuff, like the need for video editing has risen dramatically amongst music teachers to just to understand how to do that if they want to create videos for their students. And that's why I've ended up deciding to do this course. But it's, it's just such a great skill to learn. But, but with the graphic design, I know you wanted to talk about Canva a little bit, but the graphic design side of things, I, I started to, I just needed to know how to edit images to put on my website, you know, and, and I needed to know how to do things like crop the image or reduce it down in size or I wanted to put text over the top of the image or I needed to remove a background and who even thought that you could do that and oh my gosh you can you can remove the background behind this other thing that's in the picture and it's amazing and then you can put that picture on another background and it looks really cool and all of that stuff I mean I I really have over the years mostly used Keynote for that purpose and just done the image editing inside Keynote and then maybe used something like a screenshot tool. Um, I've used Snagit for years and years and years, and I still use that now. There may be better options out there, but, you know, Snagit's working for me. It's still working for me. It's great. And so I use that, and I can I can do all these things. But Canva came along, and I think I heard about it maybe on a podcast or something, and Canva is this online graphic design tool, and uh, it has a free option. You can just sign up and use it for free. And if you are using a paid option, you you get access to a lot more of the elements that you can use in your design. So the thing about Canva that that really it tipped me over into using Canva all the time is that they have a design library of elements. So if I need a picture of a monkey, I can go into Canva, type monkey in, and I will have about 400 different monkeys to choose from. There'll be photograph ones versus drawn, like you know, graphic ones, what do you call it? Illustrated sort of versions, clip art style, like, and there'll be any number of like a realistic monkey, a cute monkey, a monkey that looks happy, a monkey that looks sad. And, you know, you can put them in and they've all got the background removed. They are elements that you can freely move around on your design and place them where you want. And in addition to things like that, it's got, you know, frames and lines and patterns that you can use in your design like just got so so many things in there and it just has become my my one stop place to do everything so all designs that you see all images on my website a lot of the ones in my keynote files you know I I have often designed something in Canva first and then put it into those other places but it's just been such a, a great tool and then teachers started using it and they actually started this education account 12, just over 12 months ago. They, they did Canva for Education where teachers can sign up for a free account and then apply for their education version, the upgraded account, and it's for free. So teachers can get access to all of these extra elements for free as well. And, it, and the templates, there's a whole stack of templates to it. I didn't even mention that. So, yeah, so if you want to start a design for a poster, you can look through their templates and go, okay, I want one that is laid out in that sort of way and then I'll put that on my design and then I might change the font and I'll change the colours and switch out the background image and it's just so, it's just such a great tool. It doesn't do everything. There's a few things that annoy me that it can't do like in terms of the way you edit images but for the most part it's it's all great. It's just fantastic. So that's been a huge change just using Canva and that came along a few uh, a few years ago now. I adopted that one really early actually and it's just grown and grown and grown and started by Australians. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> Australian there you go. run wow. company, yeah. So I had no idea. I've purposefully sort of like 
it's because I have tools for this kind of stuff. You know, I, I really, I, I spent a lot of time really getting into the deeper features of Photoshop over the summer. And uh-huh. I'm being the Mac nerd that I am. I have, like, there are really Mac OS friendly competitors to yeah. the Adobe stuff. Like Pixelmator was my recent, one of my recent app of the week picks on this show. And um, uh, Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo are like, I mean, these are apps that are often, they're, they're premium priced, but they're nowhere near the $10 a month Photoshop. You know, they're yeah. like one-time purchases. They, they look and feel more like they belong on the Mac. Like if you've used iWork or something like that, like Keynote pages, like you're, you're going to feel more at home. And, uh, but, but yeah, but the Canva is, you know, I, I've heard there's just so much buzz surrounding it, but I purposefully resisted setting up an account because I wanted to like just soak up your passion and knowledge about it before we dove in. <laughs> Did I say I'm passionate? <laughs> yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and to be honest, like if you are someone, like for me, I, I have used other graphic design tools in the past and there are some things that you're going to find bug you in Canva. Like for instance, in any of the Mac apps, you can select, let's say, four images that you have on a page and you can go into the, the width and height settings and just type one number into the height, say, of the right. image. And they will all magically match that height, you know, whatever pixels you set or centimetres or whatever. And that's fantastic. There's nowhere in Canva to select images and type a number into a box to say exactly what you want in terms of the, the sizing. So you can drag, you can select multiple images and drag them all bigger or smaller at the same time, but dragging, it's not the same. I want precision. <laughs> I need precision sometimes. So that's something I'm missing from Canva. But there's only, there's probably two or three things like that, which are probably going to come at some point for a start. And you you can kind of get away with, like I can I can live without them because there's so many other fantastic things. And for Canva... It's that collection of of library of elements and templates. Like I can't tell you, when I say there's a lot of stuff in there, like you, you can't believe it until you go looking and you just go, oh, my gosh, like I don't know, it's 40,000 of this and 400,000 templates of this. I don't know. I'm, I'm making up numbers. <laughs> but there's a lot, of, a lot of things included in there which will, again, help you save time because you get started with a, a basic design and then you can change it and add it and stuff. And sometimes if I do want to design in a different app, you can put the, desi- the, the element or elements, plural, that you want, that you found in Canva, and you can export them from Canva. You can download them with a, a transparent background and then put it into your other, right. you know, your other app. So I, I do do that sometimes too. But yeah, I just, I live in Canva now. It's, I'm in there nearly every day. And my team, you know, people who work with me, <laughs> we're all in Canva. Well, a couple of us are in Canva a lot. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's awesome. So my, I guess what I thought prior to this conversation that it was, was sort of like a watered down Photoshop tool that it runs in a web browser. And, but, it, and it sounds like to some extent it's, accomplishing that but it also sounds much more resourceful in terms of like yeah like you have, it's a bit you're licensed to use like a lot of yes. graphics yes correct yeah and you you pay for that so if you've got the free account you can see all the paid elements in there as well you can see that the paid things in there so when you're in the free account you can add anything that's a free element and it, it tells you when you're looking at them into your design and use them at no cost if you want to choose a paid element, you add that to your design and when you download your design, you will, you can pay for it on a one-off basis for an image or a an element of some sort. If you've got the pro account or the education account, you can use all of those at no extra cost. So you, you can download them and use them for no extra cost. So I, I ended up doing a whole course on Canva last year. I did it in July. It was June maybe. It was fantastic because I ended up thinking – Teachers need to know about this and how fabulous it is for creating teaching materials because so much of the time I see in Facebook groups, people ask the question, where can I find free images or, you know, where's a great place to get clip art? And, you know, you can go searching online to all the different websites and you can download a thing from here and a thing from here. And again, you're just looking at all these different locations and it takes a lot of time up searching for all those things and I'm kind of like you know if you just go into Canva you type in the search box and it's inside Canva already like it's just there and you're probably going to find more options than than what you would on the you know just the general by generally googling and so yeah I've, I've 
ended up doing this course. We had, I think we had about 800 teachers doing this course at sort of like together over a course of uh, three weeks or four weeks or so. And I did modules where you had to create a design. Each module was a different design. So the first one was like create a poster. So I ran through how to do it in Canva and then teachers had to share the designs that they'd made. And, oh, my gosh, the creativity, it was so Mm -hmm. phenomenal. And the funniest thing that came out of that course, which I did not predict at all, was that all the teachers in the course were creating teaching materials for the purposes of the course and sharing them in this pop-up Facebook group that we had. And someone started saying, hey, I love your design for that worksheet. Do you mind if I use that with my class? And so all the teachers started sharing their designs with one another and I ended up setting up collections in a place where they could each, everyone could download everyone else's designs because we ended up with this repository of Canva templates of hundreds of worksheets and posters and like animated graphics like GIFs and videos and all sorts of things. So it was this amazing just I just did not predict that that would happen. It was such a, a great extra thing that came out of this course. So, yeah, so that, that's been, I think you mentioned in your, like the show notes, I'm giving away stuff here, but in the show notes about what's, you know, one of the favourite things, well, no, what did you say? Technology that you receive the most positive feedback from. Oh, and yeah. I reckon this is definitely one of those tools where I think it's one of those ones that you don't, you didn't know you needed it until you look at it and now you cannot live without it. It's that, that kind of tool. So, yeah, definitely one of those ones. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to hit the ground running with this. So it seems like the teacher account – so the teacher account gets you all the same stuff as a paid professional account. Is that the right Pretty much, yeah. And I've been careful not to say I, it's not identical to the pro account, but right. it's getting – there was only like two or three things which were not in the education version, which were in the pro account. But at least one of those now is in the education version because they had so many people. This was a, there's an there's right. an effect called background remover. So if I added a photo of myself into Canva, I could click a button and it would remove the background and leave me, you know, as with a transparent background. Right. And that one feature was in the pro version and not in the education version. And all the teachers are like, "Come on, we need this!" And finally, <laughs> they've added it in. Maybe oh, okay. maybe a month ago, maybe a couple of months ago now. So. Thank goodness, because uh, when I put the course together, the bad thing about putting the course together is that I, I don't have an education account. I've got the pro account. So I made a video like, here's how to remove a background. <laughs> and then <laughs> the teachers are going, I don't see that button in my account. And I'm like, oh, no, it's not an education version. <laughs> so I had to then make another video saying, okay, I'm so sorry it's not there, but I'll leave the video here in case it gets added in. So now it, now it has couple of things like that. I feel like there was one other thing too, but yeah, they're, they're pretty much the same, pretty much the same. And I think it's important. What we found with a lot of people, because I had a lot of people applying for the education account for this course, like all at the same time, we found out it's best to apply with your school email address because then, then it is more obvious that you are a teacher. Um, and after you've applied, you, you have to fill out a form. Or I haven't seen a better form, which, you know, you have to verify that you're a teacher. So you have to send some kind of proof to them. They've got a list of options there. If you don't hear back from them, one of two things has happened. They've either just upgraded your account and you don't even know. So keep checking. You log into Canva and there's a place where you can check what type of account you've got. And lots of teachers were thinking they hadn't been upgraded because they hadn't got a notification from Canva. And they go in and they're like, oh, actually, I do have the education version. It's just been magically upgraded because it's a cloud service, you know. And the other thing is you can just send them a message saying, hey, you might be working through a backlog of people right now, but I haven't got my verification. Can you check it? And they will. They're very responsive on Twitter. That was the, the piece of advice that I was offering to people. You just DM them on Twitter or tag them or something. And uh, right. yeah, they're pretty good at getting back. That's good to know. Definitely How- give it a go. Add it yeah. into your toolbox no I'm, I'm using it right here i mean and, and this comes i just keep coming back around to this whole idea of like web software like i have become more comfortable with using software that runs in a web browser for any if if anything just because i am in front of my computer more now than i ever have been and it's like less convenient to like have a bunch of tabs open and like because i don't have to like you know i'm a pretty mobile person that's why the ipad has been such an important thing to me is like the you know the, the more I can like just pick up whatever screen is closest and like that's going to have a yeah. window into my data 
the better. And, you know, web stuff is unfortunately, like, it doesn't integrate into the file system. Like, I can't search the spotlight for something I've made in Canva. Oh, but... I, know. I love spotlight. Oh, God. oh, my gosh. I use it, like, all day, every day. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm so shocked when people don't know that if they've got a Mac. Obviously, it's Mac only. But, yeah, I'm constantly command space bar <laughs> looking in, in my spotlight for things. I, I have been with you on that whole web software versus locally installed, but I've, m- I've much more moved into the web software and been more comfortable with it, except for a few things. There's just a handful of things, and it's mainly like video. Can't, can't let that go. That's got to be locally, <laughs> locally done, yep. you know. Mm-hmm. And it depends what you're editing. If you're editing something really simple, uh, WeVideo is going to be great for you, and, and to a certain extent, WeVideo is going to meet the needs of a lot of music teachers. But... For me, you know, I just it, I just need it locally. If it's going to be a little bit more complex, it's it's not going to cut it necessarily in the web browser. But yeah, for most things, I really have moved over to web. I I made the break because I work with people who are all in different locations around, literally around the world. We live in Google Docs, you know, all the, mm-hmm. the variations of Google Docs. So you know, Docs and spreadsheets and everything, and Canva as well because it's web based. You know, people I work with can log into the same Canva account and see my designs and change them and duplicate them and alter them and all the things. So we really do live a lot in, in cloud-based stuff now. But but for my own personal things, I you know, I, I won't let Sibelius go, really. <laughs> like I'll yeah, still use I know, that. I know. Yeah. But, yeah, and that's often for things for me, like the video editing too. It's it's things that only I need to, to use the video software. So, you know, it's just me doing the editing, so I'll stick with that. Google Docs has, and I don't know if they made this change or if Apple did, but they, there's one tiny change that has made it so much more tolerable for me to use. And it, <laughs> it's it's because, I mean, and I, and I, Google Docs is, has some, some obvious strengths. Like I don't, like all Office and iWork now do the thing where you can like share a document with another user and they can open it in a web browser or in the native app and they can, you can both be typing in it at the same time and um, of course, Google has such a lead here that like no one even, I mean, yeah. my school is an Office 365 subscriber and we use Outlook predominantly for email, but like nobody knows that instead of a Google Doc, you could just open up Word and then email me a link and I can be typing in my Microsoft Word into the same thing that yeah. you're typing into. But Google does have some things. I mean, they certainly I feel a little bit more confident that Google is syncing. Like when, like if if I type, we're sharing a Google Doc right now with some notes. If I type a character into it, I know that you're seeing that character on the screen, like pretty much the instant that I type it. Yeah. But anyway, so but again, this thing like I love the spotlight and Google Docs will now on um, iOS will appear in the spotlight search on an iPad and an iPhone, which is great. And then this is my main thing on the iPad. I regret that there's no like sense of like having a desktop space. So I put I you can. Know but you can put the files. So the files app has a widget. I have a a statement later about widgets, but you can basically install a widget for the files app on your, on the left side of your iPad's home screen. So that permanently fixed to your home screen is your eight most recently modified documents across all of your. So if you're using the Google drive app, it'll actually now show your most recently opened Google docs, from Google, oh, the Google good. Drive app in that files. And I'm like, yes, finally, I feel like yes. I'm using the same computer, even if it's the iPad or the Mac. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, oh, man, the file management on the iPad, man, that's just been so hard over the years. It's still hard. And I found that people don't even realize there is that files app. Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah. in, in fact, if you utilize that well, that's the th- the big problem with something like GarageBand. You're using GarageBand, you want to either send a file somewhere from GarageBand or get a file into GarageBand from somewhere. And that, you know, it's been notoriously difficult over the years to do that. And it seems like something you would think that that, that would be one of the primary things I would work out first. But, yes. you know, it's been hard, but people don't realise that of anything, the Files app, of course, that's going to be a really good option because it's an Apple thing and GarageBand's an Apple thing and that's going to be easy to access inside GarageBand and, you know, as a portal, essentially. And so saving things into there or getting them out of there and organising things in there, it's just, you know, it's, it's so much better but like a lot of people just don't realise it's a thing. And I think I even was late to the party. I mean, it's probably... A, couple of years ago now, whenever it came out, I felt, I was like, oh, what is this Files app that's appeared on my, you know, with one of the updates that just right. like magically appeared. 
as most things do with Apple. And yeah, and I was like, oh, 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 okay, this is good. This is actually kind of the answer to a lot of the problems that have been in the past. So yeah, so that's what I, I mostly use. But I still do find it's confusing when you're inside an app and you're browsing your files, say in GarageBand, it's just, there's different views and different things show depending on what settings you've got chosen. And then you mm -hmm. like, why can't I see this thing? You need to check another box or drop, go into a menu and, and turn it on or turn it off. And right, right. It's still well, not a perfect thing, but it's better. Yeah. If I, if I'm in the files app and I like, let's say I put an iWork cause you can on the Mac, you can check this setting that will sync your desktop and documents folder through your iCloud drive. So I have that checked on. So what I do on my iPad is I basically just keep all my documents in the desktop or the documents folder. It's like more yeah. temporary if it's in desktop. So I can put an image on my desktop right here on my Mac and then go to my iPad and then open the desktop folder and the files app and it's there. But the thing is, is you can also like link Dropbox and Google Drive and OneDrive into the files app. So like your stuff from those drives yes. show up in the same interface, which is kind of yes. cool. I think that's I think that's where it, when it got better. It was just that easy access to things, man. But GarageBand is crazy, though. I I have to send you a, po a blog post. I wrote like I feel like maybe four years ago now because there's this feature where I th forget which direction it went, but like Logic it was the headline was like Logic can now export to a GarageBand project for the iPad or something like that. And I was like, ooh, I'm gonna have fun <laughs> trying this. So I did it, and then my whole blog post ended up being just entirely about the file management workflow because. <laughs> yeah. Because there are three places that a Mac will yes. save, well, by default, not even just talking about you put it where you want, but there are three GarageBand folders on a Mac. One of them, I'll tell you them all now. <laughs> One of okay. them is the local, like it's in the music folder, you know, music, that local yeah. folder that by default you have on your Mac where your iTunes music goes. It's called GarageBand. And by default, it will save any projects lo to your local hard drive in that folder. Okay, done, easy enough. Well, then inside of your iCloud drive, there's a there's a GarageBand for Mac OS folder and a GarageBand for iOS folder. And um. any GarageBand project you try to save, like they don't, it's not like a Pages or a Keynote where it just the same file works with the same features no matter which yeah, device exactly. you're on. Yeah, exactly. You have to like too different. Yeah, you have to like yeah. run a process to get the something that's in your Mac. I, I'm sorry, something in your GarageBand iOS folder to like turn. You have to transform it into something that can live in your Mac folder which then can be open yeah. on the mac you throw logic into the mix and now you've got like just to get something from your mac to your ipad takes like four or five different files being created it's insane this is what i mean it's just like why is it so hard mm, yeah because <laughs> this because the i feel like video is a lot it's a long time before we can do really good cloud video but i feel like the internet speeds and i feel like the technology is there where i could do something like i feel like this podcast is just going to end up being like two roughly hour plus long audio files like that is easily something that i have the bandwidth to sync over the cloud so if yeah. apple could be i just want them to be the first people to like either, whether it's logic or garage band to say hey we've got a digital audio workstation all you got to do is put the file in icloud drive and it'll just open on ios or mac yeah yeah that would be good <laughs> that's my dream i don't know I'm, i tend to like go on at least one pipe dream tangent on this podcast at every episode <laughs> that was it that was it for today <laughs> i love it i love it yeah you just want life to be easy i think right. that's the, the key mm. totally well what what are the things that i feel like we're half potentially halfway through this list here maybe I mean, yeah. is <laughs> how honestly how long do you have i don't want to like occupy your whole because i know you've got I'm still good. I'm all good. This could be just like a yeah. little bit inside baseball, but I'm just curious. Oh like, I mean, your podcast, first of all, people should listen to your podcast. I like it. It's like really, you, what do you do? You say like maybe two or three episodes a month about? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> in my mind, in my dreamland, <laughs> there's an episode every week, very consistently. Right. Right. <laughs> and in reality, no, it's not happening. <laughs> so I have bursts of consistency. And so like, if you look back through old episodes, they'll be like, you know, for six weeks, oh my gosh, an episode came out every single week. It was like a miracle. And then like right now, I've been attempting to get one out for about three weeks now. And, you know, doing this video course i am mm. like it's, I'm, I'm a little bit behind i'm going to be honest a little bit behind where i want to be with this video course and so i'm kind of like in that do i just 
forget the podcast until I've at least got three modules completed for this course and then worry about it. Or do I just, you know, if I do that, it's going to be ages. So do I just get one done? I am working one at the one at the moment, but I would like it to be weekly. And at some point I, I do try, you know, in my general life productivity wise, I try to batch things. I mean, this is the best way to work really. You, you batch process stuff where you can. So if it's solo episodes, just me talking where, you know, a lot of them are, I can sit down and if I prepare two or three episodes, I can then just hit record and record two or three episodes in one day. And then I'm good for the next three weeks. Happy days, you know, a bit of editing. But it's hard, you know, and if it's interviews, of course, they just happen when they're scheduled, when it works for the other person. So you can't, generally speaking, you can't be doing two or three of those in a day. Like it's just impossible. It's one and then you might do another one a couple of weeks later. So yeah, so it's hard. But The solo episodes in a way easier because it is just me and it's where I can just slot it in and it's me, you know, trying to not maybe make it too long because podcast episodes don't have to be long. I I do longer ones always with the interviews because I just get talking to people and I like chatting and I'm so interested in what other people are doing. But, you know, solo episodes, I try to make it a very targeted, here's five tips about this or here's three apps that will do this or here's, you know, I think I did a, a two-part one called 22 Ways to Use GarageBand and Soundtrack with Your Students. So I split that over two episodes and because it, it doesn't all need to be, you know, really long episodes. So so at the moment, yeah, I'm working on, I've got like three episodes or I've got a whole list of episodes to do and it's just a case of sitting down to do them. But But I love it and it's just a good way of sharing tips in a different format really and sometimes it's better to share them on a podcast episode but then there's other things where I was going to make an episode recently I can't remember what the topic was but I thought that's just not going to translate to an audio format like it makes no sense whatsoever so it'll be a YouTube video and that's fine yeah so it's always that that weighing up but I really I really do enjoy it I I think the podcast it's such a funny medium like you, you would have this as well where I record, things get published and it goes out and you really have no idea if anyone's listening or if they care or if they enjoy what they're listening to. And it's made me try to make more of an effort to leave reviews on other people's podcasts or to comment or tag them on Twitter or something. And I really don't do it enough. I actually was going to set myself like a calendar or event or an alarm or something to like, okay, go comment on three podcasts, you know, right now, just do it. Because the podcasts that I listen to, I love. Like, they are part of my life, you know. Right. And, and you, the ones that come out consistently, I'm like, yes, it's Wednesday. So-and-so's podcast episode right, right. is going to come out. Oh, my gosh. And I, it's also been, and I've said this before, for me it's been the way that I have learnt the most over the past 10 to 12 years. I, I started listening to podcasts about 12 years ago. And it's been a regular thing every single day from then. Like, every day. And... They fall into all different categories. They're education technology ones, they're music education ones, they're music ed tech ones, and then there's a whole stack which don't are nothing to do with music or education, which are just like interesting things, interesting stories or interesting, I don't know, topics uh, which are discussed. And such a way I've learnt about technology over the years. I, I, I This is where I often hear about the latest app or an update or, you know, something's changed in Google Meet. People think that I'm, like, keeping up with all these different sources of information. I'm like, no, there's just, like, four podcasts I listen to and I get it all from them. (laughs) Like, really, really, I get everything from them. And so then I'm like, oh, that sounds like a great app. Like, someone shared, here's a little app thing that I discovered recently through a podcast. It's called, and this is such a simple, silly thing, it's called Profile Pick Maker. And you go there, you upload a photo, and it automatically removes the background from your personal photo, so you're just left, and it puts you in a circle, and it presents you with about 24 different versions of you in a circle with all different backgrounds, and it looks amazing. So if you want, like, a really slick-looking profile picture for all your social media platforms or just to even use in a a keynote presentation like here's my introductory slide and here's a cool picture it's such a great cool thing but I just heard about it on a podcast you know someone just mentioned it and I was like hey that sounds good yeah really worth checking out so 
Yeah, from that point of view, this is the way I learn things. And the reason is uh, because a lot of people say, I don't have time to learn, you know, I don't have time to sit there watching videos. And, and it's like, well, podcasts, I do, it's some, I'm always doing something while I'm listening to a podcast. I am nearly always washing up, cooking something in the kitchen, cleaning the house. I'm out for a walk or a run when I'm running, injured at the moment, but not running. But, you know, at that point, I'm listening to a podcast and or I'm in the car and so I'm always doing something. I'm making use of this time and, and multitasking in that way and it's not taking away from the thing that I'm doing but I'm just learning stuff as I go. It's just such a great a great way to learn things or just to pick up information. And no, I don't remember everything I hear but I remember to write it down to go back to it later on. I'll be like, ooh, I should check that app out or oh my gosh, that's a great tip about using this or that's a great shortcut that someone's mentioned. I'll just make a note to go back and, you know, test it out or check it out or, or explore it later on. Such a great thing. So what about you? You must, same. What's that? In in terms of learning and, and things, you must you must listen to a lot of podcasts too, do you? I do. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Technology is like a big chunk of it because I think I think people who are technologically inclined just tend to be more willing to learn the tools to make podcasts yeah. and therefore there are a lot of good tech podcasts i mean i people ask how do i learn all the stuff i learn i just follow a couple of blogs and listen to the you know a couple of podcasts it's easy to say i mean some of my favorites are i, I really like specifically just since we've, we've spoken a lot about apple products i mean i really like upgrade <laughs> which is jason snell's and mike hurley's podcast the, the mac power users podcast yeah is, i used uh, to listen to that one actually I got a bit a, overwhelmed and I went, you know, I, <laughs> you also have to kind of pick and choose what, yeah, I should go back to that. I also, I, I do this thing where I'll listen to a podcast a lot for a while and then I'm like, eh, I think I might just leave that one for a bit and then I'll bring another right. one into my, my repertoire and then I'll often go back to ones that I used to listen to. So yes, I should go back to that. You can mm. cherry pick the Mac power users really well because it's super topical and yeah, I agree. It's, it's overwhelming. It's one of the reasons why when I do this show, I try to make really good show notes. Like I have a blog post that's like associated with the episode where there's like clickable links to stuff because I just know that like if I were listening, when I'm listening to the Mac power users, I, I don't have to stop and take a note. I just, when I get home, I go to the, you know, yeah. like actually the show notes show up in most podcast apps. Now you just scroll down past the play controls and then yes. you have a little tappable links and i even just so while i'm talking about meta level podcasting stuff i also do chapters for every episode so if you're right now for example a music teacher and you're thinking like i don't care about podcasts other than that i listen to them you can actually <laughs> skip this conversation and go to the next topic because i will have put the chapters in so that's yeah I, it's it's a big yeah, part of my great. life for sure yeah i can't yeah. do the dishes without having a podcast in my ears it's like not and do you know what it makes you look forward to mundane tasks i'm like yeah oh, yes i've got to do the dishes <laughs> we do not have a dishwasher in my house so i am the dishwasher <laughs> my boys do other things around the house like it's their job to like mow the lawn and do all these other things but i do the dishwashing so but i, I actually strangely look forward to it because i get to listen to podcasts and that's actually the time where i save up youtube videos that i need to watch so if i for instance, at the moment, I'm, I'm giving myself a crash course in DaVinci Resolve video editing mm -hmm. software. And like, I just need to kind of churn through a few tutorial videos, you know, to see best practice of how, like, what is the better way to do this or the, the more efficient way? So I will just have them on while I'm washing the dishes on my, my iPad. I've got a stand for the iPad. It's fantastic. You know, you can tilt it all the ways and it's mm, really strong nice. and sturdy. I have that sitting there and I'm washing the dishes and I watch YouTube videos. I churn through them like that. It's fantastic. I also listen to most of them at 1.5 speed, not the podcast. I don't do that with podcasts, but I do with YouTube videos, tutorials. <laughs> I'm there. I'm up to... Make, quick, make it go quick. I'm up to one point. You're going to think I'm an insane person. I'm up to oh, like 1.8 podcast listening speed for... No, I don't like it with the podcast because <sighs> it makes me... I don't know why, but it makes me anxious. With the tutorial videos on YouTube, I'm, I'm like please get on with it like just i, I want to go 1.5 at least i've tried double speed for the videos but it's too frenetic and podcasts like just find i i get too wound up when i'm listening to people speak in my ears at that speed so mm -hmm. i've got the, mm -hmm. the apple airpods in and yeah, I, yeah I just need the normal normal speed for that yeah mm. i mean there's something to be said for listening to it in the I just, with the tech ones, I won't, I won't do it with the music ones. Like I've been, there's a new podcast, which I'm going to refer to later that I really like called the third story. It's a music podcast. It's all interviews with musicians. And 
it just so happens that the taste that this host has in music is really similar to a lot of what I've been listening to lately. So he's got Excellent. great interviews with artists that I really care about their philosophy and worldview and process. And I just don't want to not, you know, I wouldn't ever dream of listening to that in anything other than like the cadence of the actual conversation, how it was yeah. unfolding in person. So, but when I'm listening to a tech podcast, I mean, I'm just, you know, like the Mac Power users, I just want, tell me the, feed me the apps, you know, yeah, <laughs> let, it, yeah, let it come just... as fast as possible. <laughs> uh, efficiency. It's a good thing. <laughs> so you, you talked about it kind of being like a, a black hole and that you don't, you almost don't know like what people think. Like, do you use like what kind of analytics do you use to like measure I'm just in this now I'm getting really meta because I'm just curious I when I, I have recently moved this show to Libsyn just because I yeah. wanted to know were there enough people listening to it that was actually worth me because if there were like five people yeah. listening to it I wasn't going to do too because much because you like... just don't know it's so it's like I was saying it's such a weird medium because when you are doing a when you're in front of a group at a conference and you're presenting you see people you for a start you see how many people are in the room you also see their reactions to things that you're doing so you go okay they're liking this or they're with me or they're laughing or that you can tell the people are enjoying it and and podcasts you just have no idea you're talking to nothing so yeah Lipsyn I'm I'm also I've been using Lipsyn since the start too and yeah, the, it's good because you can see number of downloads. So for people listening who, who might not know, as a podcast producer, you cannot see how many people subscribe to your podcast. Who knows why they won't let us see that. But right. you can see how many downloads you get per episode and you can go back through forever in time to, to go back. So recently we actually, at the end of each year, we published like a list of the most popular blog posts of the year that were went on to my blog and also I said let's do podcast episodes as a separate thing so that that'll come out I think later this week actually at the time we're recording and yeah it'll just be a list of the most popular downloaded episodes that were released in 2020 but it was super interesting going back through and to see what was the most popular episode like of all time for instance and just things like that like I I find it really interesting and it, it informs you of what you might do in the future it's like oh clearly this was something that resonated with people I'll, I'll go back and do another one of those so yeah so I, I i do look at them as well and you can see I mean, you probably looked at this too like the the countries like where are people located right, in the world yeah. who are listening to your podcast and for me it's funny as an Aussie and, and this is true of my website as well most of the people who go to my website and who listen to the podcast are in the states and the and I think the states and Canada are the top two, and then Australia is a little bit down the list, like fourth maybe. And then there's like random listeners. It's so funny you can hop your mouse around this world map and see like there's someone in <laughs> I don't know some like strange, not strange, some small location in South Africa or in some island like there'll be an island in the middle of like blue ocean and you're like well, where even is that and you'll see that there's a little country <laughs> or a little island somewhere right. and you know there's three listeners there like who are these people yeah but fascinating fascinating to see where they're all located and um, I, I love looking at that yeah it's so interesting yeah it, it has it has encouraged me that actually I should take some time to yeah. know, keep this up to some degree but i yeah it's interesting you just and again it just all comes back to like what are things that are interesting to teachers and what are the things that are student facing my most i think one of my most i would have to make sure but something that definitely continues to get downloads when i check the stats is episode 14 i had Teresa dusaku on and we talked a lot about like google apps and jamboard yeah. which are super topical right now like everyone yeah, yeah. is using these tools and I'm like, I yeah. was listening to that episode the other day, actually. I had it downloaded and for some reason I hadn't listened to it when it first came out. And I was scrolling back through just like a week or two ago. But, oh, I've still got that episode to listen to because I've got a big backlog of unlistened things. Oh, yeah, I've got, that's, app, that's a real problem for me. <laughs> I, I stress out after a while and I just kind of delete lots of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And like, it's because like, it becomes, you feel like it's a to-do list. It's like, no, I don't have to do this. Exactly, <laughs> right. This is for me. <laughs> And this is why I unsubscribe. Like sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm just not listening to that at the moment. I'm constantly deleting their episodes for whatever reason, not because it's bad, but it might be, you know, I'm just not into that into that topic right now. So I will unsubscribe from that podcast and then probably go back to it at some point. But but yeah, I was listening to her to her episode as well, and um, she's great. <laughs> she's great. Yeah, she's awesome. She's awesome. Uh, 
Yeah, really, really cool. It's fun. It's fun to talk about this, and this reminds me too about your blog. I had a another inside baseball question about your blog. And yeah. Canva, do you did you do all of? Because I just I really like your headers. You know, like um, the graphics that that are at the you know where, that the title is fixed over. Is that yes. a Canva template or something you made in Canva that you reuse? Actually, no. Well, it depends which page you're on. Yeah, it really depends. So, like one. Are you talking one of the pages which you click through, say, like, if you're interested in iPad stuff, that one, or... I think it's the blog. No, it's, like, the CSS of your website. The blog The blog sites have, like, the title is sort of, like, vertical, like... Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, that is Canva. <laughs> yes, I know what you mean. Yep, the blog post, say. like, the feature image. Yes. Yeah. It's on an it. angle, yeah. <laughs> Robbie's indicating with his hands for those who can't see what we're doing visually. <laughs> I'm just drawing, like, a and line. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Yeah, so yes, that is in Canva. I actually had it. I needed to get a new logo done. So, and I just wanted like the color palette um, decided and organized like by a proper graphic designer so, mm-hmm. and fonts and things. So, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, I uh, had a graphic designer come and kind of like do a package. And so she came up with a template for Canva, which we now use. So, oh, cool. there's like a title and like a colored banner across an image and then the text of whatever the title is on there yeah and so that's all in canva so that's the great thing about canva you can set up a template which you can then share very much like a google doc you can give uh, a temp it's kind of like when you do that make a copy in google docs you can do that in canva Uh, and so she did that and yeah so we just use that consistency is so so much a thing on websites like if if things are consistent just everything looks better And having consistent images like that with the same font used and, you know, the same colours used, colour palette all the time, really makes a difference. And then when things get shared on social media, like I notice it with other people I follow, oh, yeah, that's one of that person's. You can see at a glance that it's a a Tony Vincent thing that has been shared. You know, you go, okay, yeah, that's Tony's style or whoever it is, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's Canva. Yep. This is one of my next <laughs> things. This is on my like list of ex- long ter- longer term things is to get my act together on this cuz I just yeah. I throw together those background images cuz the way that my website does it is whatever if I choose an image, if I put an image in the post, it'll by default make that the header, but it doesn't if it has text in it, it won't look good cuz the title will be fixed. I've just got to yeah. I got to figure this out. <laughs> it's this is the pain that I've been through over many years and it is so painful. And you, once you've got it worked out, my, my tip is to, when you get it looking good, instantly write down what you did because like if it's like me, you'll forget and then you'll go back to it like the next week and you're thinking, oh my, what was the thing I did to make it look good in the end? So right, right. I have a big product. I don't know if we've talked about this before, but I have a big, one of my big productivity things is to record processes for everything in the business because if someone gets sick in my business and they are the only one who knows how to do whatever task, then it's going to be very bad, you know, or if, if they can't work for a while. And I mean, coronavirus has been a great example of things can go wrong in a very short period of time. And so in the business, uh, but also for my benefit, processes that are written out. So there's a separate Google doc for each thing. Like it might be like how to add an image to your blog post. And there will be a process and sometimes it has literally three steps and sometimes it might have 23 steps and occasionally there's screenshots involved in the document. Sometimes there isn't because you don't need it, but everything's recorded. So I've particularly done this over the years with things like (laughs) when I'm running a live webinar, (laughs) when you do it, you're kind of like, Oh, there's no way I'm going to forget that. Like it was so painful to get get, get together and get started and, and do it the right way and get it working. And then a month goes past because I do once a month live webinars and the next month I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what I just did like the last time and to make it work and which are the settings that I used and how did I set this up. And anyway, so I write it all down in a Google Doc and then we have a spreadsheet which gathers together like a table of contents all of the processes. So we call it the training catalog. It's like my business training catalog. So if anyone starts new in the business, they can actually go to this spreadsheet and look up. I need to know how to add someone manually to the mailing list for whatever reason. I don't know. Or I need to update someone's contact details or I need to, you know, add an image to a blog post. (laughs) And they can look up in the spreadsheet and then there's a link to the Google Doc in the spreadsheet. They can click that and open it and see the process. 
And sometimes there's even a, a video, a walkthrough video in the spreadsheet as well, like a, a separate column with a spreadsheet, um, with a video link, and it might be someone talking through how to do that thing. So it works really well. And writing stuff down, when you're in the throes of that, that time, it seems like an extra hassle to write the steps down. But it's paid off for me so many times where sometimes I'll go, oh, how did I do that thing? And I'm like, I wonder if I wrote that oh my gosh, there's a whole document I wrote for myself, for my future right, right. self, and I didn't even remember I did it. And it's all there. And I'm like, thank, thank you, me. <laughs> thank you, me. Yeah, I know. I'm, yeah. I'm really bad at this part, part of like when I'm managing a project, like I front and end load them. So I am incredibly organized and I, I have great foresight and I plan. And then I like lose steam inevitably in the middle of any large project. <laughs> and then when I get to that end part, the crunch where you have to like last minute, like tie up the loose ends, I always forget <laughs> all the work I did early and then redo yes. it. <laughs> yes. It's so true. Yeah. I, templates, I, I do yeah. the same. Templates I've just are learned, Yeah. I think, I think I've learned what my weaknesses are over time. And, and that is one of the things is like just forgetting the process or what, what setting did I use when I uploaded that video or, you know, ScreenFlow when I'm making videos, like what, what is the best resolution, which is going to kind of look good, but still work. Okay. And not be too massive a file. And, all of those things, you know, just write it all down. I love write it. it all I, down. I love it. Yeah, not so much for lists, but for to dos and projects. I use OmniFocus for my task management, and you've got this. There's this cool feature where you can like take, not even you can do it. You could do a text file, but you could also just like in a note, you could have like, you know, winter concert colon, and then that is the project title, and then a dash with a space, and then that's task one, and then task two, and you can sort of do like a bullet point list that you write in plain text, and then you can actually import it into OmniFocus and like OmniFocus can be trained to look for certain placeholders that it will interpret as due dates and deadlines and tags. So awesome, yeah. I can like say when I run my winter, I do actually have a template for the winter concert and I can actually tell it the date of the concert. And then like the tasks will align themselves so that like when I'm looking at the today view inside of the app, like if, you know, like I don't have to pack the tuba into the car until like an hour before we leave for the school venue, but, yeah. but I have to make the programs a few days earlier. So those tasks are out of sight, out of mind until the actual yes. day. Yeah. And yeah. it's pretty cool. And I'm excited because my three fifths of my music team are now using OmniFocus and I'm about oh, to just nice. buy it for the other two. <laughs> because <laughs> they've announced collaboration is coming in the next year or so. Like, uh, you, or, oh, like you can sorry. share a project. Yeah. We use Asana in my business. And, oh, you're good. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, and, and to be honest, I think any of those apps, it doesn't matter which one you're using because all of them have strengths and weaknesses and they all kind of roughly do the same thing. So, you, But you have to commit to adopting it. That, that's right. the biggest right. thing I've found. And if you're not all in and all if you're working with other people, you need to all be all in with using Asana or whatever it is. And yeah, so we have in Asana, we have like template tasks, things that we do over and over and over. Like for instance, that monthly live webinar that I run, there's a series of things that need to happen to make that, to make that occur. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens before the event, then there's the event happens, and then there's a lot of stuff that happens after it as well. We're up to, I think, 43 tasks to do with running a single webinar. Wow. And there's about four different people that do different parts of the process. So I, we all share this task. We all log in and see it. So a, a lot of the early things are me. You know, it's me deciding the topic. It's me writing a description for the topic so that then it can go onto a, a sign-up page. And then someone has to make the sign-up page and then someone has to set up the form behind the scenes so that when people put their name and address or email address in that it, it gets tagged with they want to go to this webinar and all of these things, like it's tiny, tiny steps and so much goes into that process and... So, yeah, now we're up to 43 things. And then some people rely, like, they need me to decide the topic and write the description before something else can happen. So they can see in Asana, Katie's done that, and I pop the link in there or I attach the, the file to, to the task. And, yeah, it's, it's a great way if, if you are all committed to it. <laughs> I know, it I know, because these apps do the same thing. It's Again, it's about, like, the implementation matters. So, like, these apps all do the same thing, but how they accomplish it is so different. Yeah. And how people's brains work is so, like, everyone is so different that, like, yeah. it's so, like, I have this thing where I change my task app like switch it up every like year and a half just for a couple months i always come back to OmniFocus, but I'll, yeah it's just like there's always going to be something where it's like oh it would just be nice if it worked like a little bit different because this is my digital brain 
yeah. we're dealing with here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, you really have to find that thing that works for you personally. And it's funny, Asana ended up adding a separate view, which you can use as well as the original kind of list view. I like a list view, that's just me personally. But they also have this, you know, Trello is another option that people use. And it's Love more Trello. like, car, car, yeah, and I do too. It's just different. And I use it for certain things. But Asana ended up adding in essentially a Trello view so that if you want to work like that in Asana, you can, but you can, for some things, work in the other way, the the, cat, the, the list view. And then you can also work in a calendar view if you want to, if you want right, to see yeah. when your tasks are on a calendar. Like, it's great. There's a lot of options and flexibility. So, the, yeah, the task app well. that I recommend to most people is Todoist, and they just added the same Kanban. Um, yeah, right. You can, like, yeah, if you have a project and you have headings, you can, like, click a button, and then it'll, like, flip it so that every heading is now, like, a column with your yes. tasks represented as little draggable cards. It's so yes. good. So we good. Use, we use Trello for a couple of projects on my music team, and it's great. It's really whimsical. We have, like, like our Hershey Park field trip. Rest <laughs> in peace, Hershey Park field trip. Um, we, oh, really? We oh, yeah. Well. Yes, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm thinking, uh, why? I don't know. <laughs> but I added a little image from the web that's got, like, roller coasters in the back, and then we do our pie <laughs> fundraiser. I've got, like, cherry pies in the background, and we have – and you can use a Kanban system can be used. You can, like – think of it differently like it can, every, every column can be a project and the cards can be tasks or like our pie thing is like every column is like a part because we get like hundreds of pies in our cafeteria and we have to sort <laughs> them and then students coordinate pickup times so like our orchestra teacher has organized that trello board so that like every column in the board is like like a like like last name initials a through f and then like we like yes. as we like organize the orders from each per kid their name gets moved from that column into like a processed yeah yeah, area yeah. And... so you can see the the process step by step yeah fantastic so, cool. so good love it love <laughs> it i i wrote in the note here that maybe we could do a lightning round of fast tech tips but then i didn't prepare any in my <laughs> <laughs> and i wrote down a few <laughs> oh, thought, good. Ooh, i don't know if they're actually like you know fantastic ones but just, a few came to mind like recent things and i was like oh just in case we're doing that i wrote it down <laughs> I, I do have one. I mean, I, th this has been surprisingly popular. So I, r I wrote about it after seeing on Twitter, some, a bunch of teachers be surprised to know that you can, in the accessibility settings of an iPhone, you can double or triple tap the Apple logo on the back and you can actually program a, a number of system actions to occur. I have done this. It's great. Yeah. yeah. So things like anything from turning on the flashlight to taking a screenshot to turning up the volume or muting or unmuting the phone. You just, it's under, uh, it's called, the feature is called back tap and you just go into the accessibility panel of settings and you can make a triple or a double tap, do a number of things, but you can assign a shortcut to the triple or the double back tap and the shortcuts are, you know, sometimes your phone will say like, Hey, usually around this time you like o open this website. Do you want to yeah. make a shortcut out of it? And then it'll save those quick shortcuts into the what is the shortcuts app everyone has it installed on their phone but most people put it in a folder somewhere Labeled you can make your crapple <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i love it the good old crapple folder <laughs> yeah but this is not this is not a crapple app this it's is definitely uh, not no no it's i just really think good. people don't know <laughs> You're right right they don't know that you can not only can you like have all these actions saved you can where you can tap and like have all these like preset things you do commonly on your phone be launched within a tap but you can also like create a shortcut that strings together you know hun literally hundreds of actions so like i have a good morning shortcut that like like an, it you know re reads me some text to remind me to take my medication my morning meditate my e meditation app headspace like opens a morning meditation and then it starts a timer called waking up getting ready for work and you know i have like this this uh, the lights in the house turn on and the alarm disarms like all this stuff happens in one yeah cool it's That's pretty great. cool yeah. And so you can have that happen with a triple or a back tap. So, you know, you can do nearly anything. And what music educators have told me they like to do is to create a series shortcut for opening the app Tonal Energy and then setting oh, that, yeah, that to would be a good, double tap. Yeah. Maybe I should do that one. I So my double tap is set to open my camera and my triple tap is screenshot. 
because yes. I do both of those things often and you kind of need to do them quickly when you need them. Exactly. But I have found <laughs> the, the double tap one, when I put my phone down on my wooden desk, mm-hmm. nearly every single time it goes, that's a double tap, you want to take a photo? And my <laughs> camera app will open. I'm like, ah, no, nah, I don't know if I should change this or just alter my the way I put my phone down on the table. So, yeah, but it's super useful. And the screenshot one particularly, because it's just sometimes awkward. You're not always in a position to put your fingers on those two other buttons to take the screenshot. Sometimes it's just easier to do that triple thing, triple tap on the back. So, yeah, so I've, I've been enjoying that too. But I might change the camera one. Maybe tonal energy would be good. Be a little reminder, like, get your instrument out. <laughs> like, oh, tonal energy's open. To oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. My my double tap is to open a new note and my triple tap is to I have the big phone and I use the um because I'm home all the time now, I use my T V more and I get to my T V remote through the control you know, the control center where you like swipe yeah. in the upper right corner of your phone screen. That's where I get to the remote control for the Apple T V. And so I oh, have yeah. to my triple tap is the thing where it's like I think it's called reachability. It's where it's like basically just takes the whole screen and like moves it down so you can reach the top without sliding oh, that's your hand. Good. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah, maybe I should test that out. Yeah, I need to explore some more things, but what, I'm just going to check what tips I wrote down. There's, I don't know. They were just ones that were totally top of mind. Um, yesterday, here's a tip. <laughs> it's just such a silly one. I was recording videos about using Loom to make videos. So it, this was it was doing my head in a little bit yesterday because, you know, Loom, for those that might not know, it's a screencasting tool and it's free and it's like Screencastify, but it's the only one that is free that on Mac and Windows will record system audio. And so this is why I've incorporated into this course. And this is the desktop version of Loom. But yesterday I was actually using the Chrome extension version of Loom to make some videos. And so I had ScreenFlow recording my screen, record, like using Loom to right. record my screen. It was very meta. And so I opened up a Google uh, tab and I'm like, I'm trying to get Loom. I hit record on ScreenFlow and then I'm recording on Loom. I'm trying to record on Loom. I'm trying to open it up and it just wouldn't open. And I'm like, oh man, maybe these two things are conflicting. Maybe it doesn't want me to try to attempt to use two screencasting tools at the same time. But I'm like, no, I know this can work fine. Anyway, I had forgotten. I've known this before and for some reason I had forgotten. You cannot launch Loom from a plain Google homepage. Hmm. site you have to be on a website or you have a doc open or something so for anyone who's using loom and has found it's like not working in adverted commas you might just be on the google homepage. don't go on the google homepage. you need to open a website why is that silly tech tip i don't know it, it i don't from a tech point of view i don't feel like it makes sense to me but there you go there there hmm. it is and i don't feel like it's very obvious from i don't know that it's very obvious that loom has said be careful not to try and do this from a Google homepage. Like, right, right. I don't know. It's very strange, which is why I didn't really remember it. But the other thing I've been liking in Chrome, uh, the Chrome browser, is to group tabs together. So this is it's a recent addition to the Chrome browser, I don't know, a few months ago maybe. And you can have, like when I'm working in the Chrome browser, you know, you have like 20 tabs open at once. And often five of them will be to do with a single thing that you're working on and maybe another three are to do with something else and another three are to do with something else. And so you can actually right-click on one of the tabs and uh, choose Add to Group or something, whatever the text is, and you can make and you can label this group. So I, for instance, have a group at the moment for this video course, so it's it's got the initials of the course. And then I've got three tabs in that group. Once you've got a group started, you can drag other tabs into that group or right click on them and say, add it to this group. And so it kind of groups the tabs together. And then when you click on uh, the first one, I think it is, or the title of the group, it will bunch them up together. So if you're not working on that thing right now and you're working on this other thing, you can bunch these ones up together and sort of like park them and reduce them down a little bit while you're doing this other thing, but you don't have to close them. And then you can work on your other thing and then bunch those ones up together. So I found this really useful in the... In a webinar I ran in, I feel like it was maybe the November webinar I did, 
I, I had to show a lot of things and they were grouped into like I'm showing this thing first and this thing first. But but for each thing I was showing, there was multiple tabs involved. So I grouped them like this and it made it really visually clear for me running the session that these first four tabs are for this group. And then I just shut them down as I went through the webinar and completed each section. So it worked really well. So that's a good one. And you can give them pretty colours, each group. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, I was today years old when I learned about tab groups in Chrome. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's a, well, and so I learned, to, you know, and, and like I didn't magically know this because I'm some sort of like intuitive person, but I had heard about it on a podcast like a couple of months ago and I was like, ooh, this tab groups thing sounds cool. Yeah, and it, it's super useful, you know. It's not like magical. It doesn't do massive amounts of things, but it, it just is enough to visually organise stuff for me while I'm working. This is awesome. I'm experimenting with this as you speak. Yeah, this good. Is so cool. <laughs> so I, I do use Chrome. I used to use Safari, and there's like an issue. Well, I have to use Chrome for getting um, using a couple of plugins for our school's Google Meets. And, I've, I've you know, there's, there's things I like about Chrome. It's generally not very performant on the Mac, but I don't want to have two different web browsers also big sur speaking of big sur issues this i feel like this is just because of my computer though it has yeah a going. for some reason it's got this weird bug where like when i click to move the window like it's very particular about where i click i just keep clicking and dragging and i'm having issues dragging yeah. my window and mm. which is a shame because the new safari on big sur is really good but chrome it is i'm not for me. willing to upgrade i hold off for as long as possible with operating system upgrades on my mac i just mm, it's good I have a, my mac mini is the one that i keep my mac mini is on a two-year-old operating system that's how i oh, rationalize it oh yeah good oh, that's a good tip all right here i've already created a work group of tabs for relating to my job nice it's a good visual aid because it's like I have this issue where sometimes I don't do this on mobile devices, but on only on computers will I have open tabs be an indication that I have not made a decision yet about something. Correct. Like, yeah, there are things this is I, how I work too. Mm. Yeah, I need to like say clip this somewhere or act upon this or whatever. Yeah, you've got to do something with the tab that's open. And, and sometimes that's a super quick thing or sometimes it's a job that takes three hours. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, yeah. That's it too. And I've spoken about that before and everybody agrees. I'm like, open tabs are, this is my like to-do list for the moment and got to get rid of them. So yeah, I'm constantly throughout the day thinking, do I need this tab open? It, it, does this need to clutter my vision and make me feel like I have another thing to do? And it, no, it might be just because I checked a website address or something and had to copy it and I don't need that open anymore. So close that thing and get it out of there. This is exciting. All right, I'll do. I'll do more group group creation later. I'll get up. Yes, <laughs> in your own time. Yeah, get, get, get back to my, my outline here. Those were good. Were those were those the ones you had? I only had my one. Yeah. I. I what else did I have? Oh, look. I'm going to just mention one more, if that's okay, because that's I just keep seeing. You know those questions you keep seeing pop up all the time, and you're like, oh my gosh, please, please, no more. The and this is again to do with video recording, is the question that pops up on Facebook is, which screencasting app can I use that will record audio from my computer and it sounds good? Because I've tried, you know, Loom, Screencastify, whatever, and it all sounds terrible. And the answer is actually not the software, it's you. <laughs> you know, It's like you're just not doing it the right way. Right. And so I ended up just making a quick explanation video and people were like, oh, oh, I didn't realise that there's two types of audio that you might want to capture when you're recording a video. It's you speaking into the microphone or it's sound coming from a website or something that lives on your computer, like a file or a, a, an app like GarageBand, whatever. And you need to tell the software to capture that computer audio sound as computer audio. You do not want to be capturing it through your computer microphone. You don't want the sound coming out of the speakers and going back through the microphone, which is why it sounds terrible. So, so that's one of my tips. Please look into your record system audio options or record tab audio options in your screencasting software. And not all of them do it. That's also the problem, but... Uh, both Screencastify and Loom will record tab audio and that's only good if you're going to stay on that one tab and not go anywhere else in that one video but Loom will do it across both Windows and Mac on the desktop version of Loom and you can just turn it on and you're good to go so there you go 
That is great to know. Good. All right. Nice tips I, I do out of frustration of seeing the same question pop up. <laughs> you probably have that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes it's an indication that's like, all right. Because, you know, I... I generally will try to, like, if I put something out there, it's usually just something that I found interesting, but I'm trying to, since last March, like, recognize more often that there are things that I take for granted that I know that are worth, won't take me any time or effort at all to just yeah. put out there and not, you know, yeah, and I've been absolutely. trying to do that more with the blog, but also with just responding to quick, like, if I see a Facebook, you know, one of the only tolerable things about Facebook is that you can learn things. So, yeah. so when I see it, it's like, oh, I can answer that question in two seconds. You know, why not? And it's yeah. pretty good. The Facebook algorithm is good. Like if I see, like I'll often see a good question from a Facebook group I'm a member of. Typically the first time I log in, like the, like I won't have to scroll very far. Like some, the other day I opened it and the first question was about, should I use open broadcasting software to make my Google meet yeah. better? And I was like, yes, you should. Yes. Thanks Facebook <laughs> or, for or knowing. Or something like it. Yeah. yeah. Or something like it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like. Yeah, yeah, thanks absolutely. for knowing that, yeah. that that was the one that was in my wheelhouse and not the 87th person asking what's better, band lab <laughs> or soundtrack. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I get them too. And, and I get tagged in a lot of posts as well because either people mention something that's on my website and they, they tag me for that reason or they tag me because they think I'm probably going to know the answer or can help the person somehow. So. Um, I actually have not been on Facebook very much in the last week. So there's, if I log in because I need to actually answer a message or something, yeah, there's like all these notifications from people who have tagged me. So I'm really sorry if I haven't gotten back to you <laughs> if you've tagged me recently. But yes, it can be hard to keep up with it all. So many yeah. questions all the time. Totally, totally. But it is, you know, being able to learn about technology and help others with technology is is one of the few bright spots. So I... I accept it. I've been real close to yes. the edge of like just I, I wouldn't say I would ever delete Facebook, but I've been close to the edge of I don't know what I would realistically do. I mean, I'm not going to be a hip like Instagram and WhatsApp are going to stay on my phone no matter what. I So I'm not going to like make a public show of my leaving Facebook because I'm still giving them my data. But yeah, I guess like I could just delete the app. <laughs> be a I have. I I periodically delete the app. Oh, I'm actually, I mostly in the the general year, like school year, work year, whatever. I usually delete the Facebook app on a Sunday night, and I reinstall it on a Friday night. And sometimes I don't reinstall it at all, and I just then only look at it on a web browser, like if I'm on my laptop. And it just it prevents me from that. I'll just check for five minutes and then I lose half an hour thing of because mm. that's what happens on the phone all the time. And so I just don't have it on my phone. At the, I have not had it on my phone right now for about probably five weeks or so. I've just oh, not had wow. it on my phone at all. The only time I put it back is if I know I'm going to a, an event where I'm going to want to share photos. And it's just easier to upload them from there. But sometimes I will even not do that. I will airdrop. This is ridiculous. I know I don't need to do this, but I will airdrop the photos from my phone to my laptop so I don't need to reinstall the Facebook app. That's <laughs> just, not ridiculous and, at and all. Just upload <laughs> yeah, it, it just stops me from, you know, getting sucked into that, that rabbit hole. Yeah. Way too easy. You don't yeah. have TikTok installed on your phone, do you? I do, and I don't dare <laughs> open it because, oh, my God, I love TikTok. So... I'm going to tell you what's coming up on my podcast. I have planned already, it's going to probably be a blog post and a podcast episode. I've planned one called, oh, I keep changing the number, but let's say eight TikTok trends you should steal for the music classroom right, right. or challenges, whatever, because there's so much creativity. I said to my boys the other day, because of course it's their fault that I'm on TikTok at all, right. and I said to them the other day, TikTok is honestly where I see the most creativity from the general public. I mean, yes, there's a lot of crap on there as well, as with every app. But generally speaking, once you've started using it and the algorithm speaks to your interests, there's so much creativity musically, choreography-wise. For goodness sake, there's a whole musical that's been put together through TikTok. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know if you've caught up with Ratatouille, the musical. Oh, I'm on it, yeah. <laughs> Holy moly, what an awesome, like, it's just, it's ridiculous and fantastic. And, you know, this creativity has come out of lockdown and apps and connectivity with apps through, you know, around the world. Like, it's just phenomenal. So 
I am a big lover of TikTok, but it's, it's, yeah, you, you can be lost on there for quite a while. <laughs> one of the, speaking of technology people we follow, the, one of my favorites is, uh, one of my favorite bloggers is named Ben Thompson, and he's got a website called Stratechery, and he, he writes more about, like, the industry and sort of the trends, yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, and he's got this, like, ongoing, really astute kind of angle on TikTok that it's, like, it sort of puts the power to create into every person into yes. every person's abilities. And I think a, that's why I love it. Yeah. But the way that the, but then on the kind of the other end of it, the algorithm is so good at targeting you specifically, not only because, because I think the thesis is more or less that because it levels the playing field and anyone can make content, there is lots of content. And because the content is so uniquely tailored to the user's you know, to the user's interests due to the algorithm, it's like endless content for the user that is exactly what you want to see. So you just yeah. keep going and going and going and going and going. And they're bite size. So like one of the creative one of the things I like is the creative restriction of time that is on TikTok. Like it's short videos. It's you know, they're five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds, whatever. And and you when you're scrolling through it's like just one more just one more just one more just one more mm -hmm. and before you know it 20 minutes has gone past and you just did not mean that i just i really i really do love it have and also the funniest thing about tiktok is because it knows you so well once you start liking videos and start following people and it, it then feeds you more of what you like and like my tiktok if i open up my app and my 15 year old son opens up his tiktok next to me we laugh so hard about the differences between our feeds because right. his TikTok, it's like all, um, it's like, you know, there's bodybuilding, there's basketball, there's, you know, some music stuff too, but his, his feed is so different to mine. Mine's got all these, it's got some educators, it's got a lot of music challenges, dance stuff. There's some gardening things in there because I'm into succulents at the moment. <laughs> there's right. gardening tips and a whole stack of photography tips. Brilliant photo iPhone photography tips on TikTok, like bite-sized tip that you can learn in, you know, 10 seconds, like how to take this cool photo. Anyway, I love it. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Lots of fun. So much fun. Well, speaking of apps that are fun or should be deleted from your phone, do you want to do app of the week? <laughs> yeah. App of the week. What did I say for app of the week? I, I, let me look at, well, yeah, for my phone, I don't know with the phone. It's super hard to narrow it down to just like one thing. It doesn't have to be then, even a phone app. Well, that's what I was going to say. It could just be not phone app. I was going to actually mention DaVinci Resolve only because I am delving into this at the moment and it's totally free and it's Windows and Mac. I was going to say Windows and PC. Windows and Mac. And the the breadth of what you can do in this free app is really pretty mind-blowing. So I wanted to mention that as an option for teachers who are wanting to explore some kind of video editing just because it's so it's just so useful and for for free it's just amazing what you what you can do and what you get and i will preface that by saying you kind of need a semi decent machine to run it on and that's true of any video editing software so it's not just because of davinci resolve but you know if you're going to be editing video you can't be doing it like i think the minimum requirement is windows 10 and mac i don't know catalina or something like whatever it is on there so you need a semi-decent machine to run it on, but it's just, yeah, such a fantastic thing. So I was going to mention that. I have heard of it for a long time and not explored it, you know, and you go, yeah, this is actually really good. So there you for, go. Is that all right for mine? <laughs> that's perfect. No, and exactly. I don't think it's been mentioned on the show. I've heard, heard okay, so good. much buzz about it lately. And as someone who's used both Adobe Premiere and Final Cut Pro, which I, I guess are like considered to be industry standards, I, I consider them as as far as professional apps go to be actually fairly intuitive to get into yeah. the basics of. Do you think that like there's got to be a catch when I hear about something so professional being free? Like, is it like more difficult to use or do you find that it's just pretty much i think it's pretty intuitive but having said that i've done video editing in the past and i'm not like an expert or anything but i i have an understanding of the concepts and how things work and maybe what to look for they have they have some videos so there's user created videos on youtube like tutorials and things and they are super useful there's a number of channels where they mostly just do davinci resolve tutorials and this they're, they're really good but they also have on their own website videos, which are, I don't know that they're actually on YouTube. They're, they seem to be just on the website. So you might not see them if you go searching on, on the website. And I like I watched their editing one the other day 
And it was just so good. And there was a whole kind of workflow that I didn't realize. I went, oh, right, that makes much more sense. That's much more efficient than what I was thinking because I was kind of like dragging things onto the timeline and editing down there. No, there's a whole other thing you can do. Right. <laughs> and anyway, you can like tell it instantly to slot a video in to the middle of a whole heap of other clips and it will move everything out of the way and slot it in. So just something like that. It's much easier than dragging everything that's in there and to make space and then dragging it all back so it all lines up. So just things like that, watching a video. So no, I think it's I think it's really quite intuitive. But having said that, if you've never used video editing software and you opened it up, you'd just go, oh my gosh, there's so much to see. I haven't really used Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro, so I, I don't know, you know how to compare it to those two. But it seems to me that DaVinci Resolve is... It's actually the go-to tool for colour grading for a lot of video editors. So they may use Final Cut or Premiere first and do stuff and then they might do colour grading in, in Resolve. I could be totally incorrect with that, but that's what it seems to me. But it happens to be that it also has all the editing features in it as well. So you could right. just use that on its own. Yeah, and there's there's an extra there's an upgrade. There's an upgraded version with extra features, but for music teachers, I don't think the extra features that you would upgrade for are probably what they need anyway. It would be overkill. Mm. So free version is all good. Yeah, I when I use professional software like that, I tend to need some of the things that are like just above the level of the basic yeah. entry, you know, like I need more than iMovie, but I certainly don't mm. use more than ten percent of what Final Cut yeah. is capable yeah. of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's see. Did I? I have one in my note, don't I? Yeah, this is topical. So <laughs> I feel like I just, <laughs> as we were like planning to meet for this, I embarrassed myself numerous times with my trying to understand time zones. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. We're weird over here anyway. <laughs> but we did discover the issue, which I had actually forgotten about. So we, we call it Australian Eastern Standard Time. And so. I'm on the eastern side of Australia, being in Victoria, and then there's New South Wales, which is in the east as well, and then we've got Tasmania. There's also Queensland. Queensland does not go and do daylight savings, even though it's also on the east coast of Australia. So it must have defaulted to a Queensland time for you, and, yeah, it's different to us. So my dad lives in Queensland, so we constantly have this sort of joke around now where we are now an hour and apart from each other, but the rest of the year we are in the same time zone. It's just ridiculous. So, and there's so jokes, yeah, jokes in Queensland about <laughs> they don't want to do daylight, daylight savings because, like, the curtains will fade. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you have these jokes in the States or yeah. the cows will get put off their milking. Like, right, you know, right. it's just this silly. <laughs> <sighs> no, that's not it. There are, there's literally people who have written that in Facebook posts. Like, we don't want to switch. No, we're not. Because over time there's often a push for them to move to daylight savings like the rest of the East Coast, but then there'll be people protesting and saying that the curtains will fade or the cows will get put off their milking. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, Apparently we have something similar in Arizona, which I didn't know because okay. I asked my wife yesterday. I guess I should explain what I'm saying. Like, so yes, you, 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 when I'm trying to coordinate, I thought you were an hour off from what your actual time zone is and was generally confused. But I asked my wife, I was like, am I going crazy? And she's like, well, like, I'm pretty sure Arizona has this too. So, so <laughs> it's not like unprecedented, but I was just like, yeah. anyway, the, the, my Apple pick of the week is, <laughs> it's, called, it's called, and you, and you had mentioned a really good one. World, is it world clock buddy? Well, which is, time buddy, I think. Yeah. World, world time, time buddy. buddy. I use a lot. Yeah. Which is a website. It shows multiple at once. Yeah. And it's a website and an app. Mm. And I, you know, it's just a great time zone you know, it's just a great way to see lots of different time zones at once. I'm going to sense, like try to send you a quick screenshot of this so you can get an idea for the interface of this. I think I can do, I wonder if I can copy. I love the thing where you can, oh, I do have another tip. If you copy something to the clipboard <laughs> on your iPhone or iPad, you can paste it to another Apple device without oh, doing great. any fancy stuff. Yeah, so there, there's my good one. So I just copied, took a screenshot of Calzones, and I'm going to try to like paste it into the chat here. I don't know if you can paste into the, yeah, see, it's not going to let me do it. I probably need to save it as an image first. Well, I'll send, I'll send this you a screenshot. Basically Calzones is an app that does more or less the same thing, but it just, it has a really intuitive to read interface where it's like, it shows you the different time zones you've added to it in rows. And then underneath those rows, it has all of your calendar events in the 
also in oh, like horizontal true. rows. So as you scroll yeah. from left to right, you see like what time, not only what the different time zones that you have added to it relate to one another, but you see the, how the calendar events in your calendar relate to other time zones. So yeah, like great. I can see that tomorrow I have a grade seven team meeting. And if for any reason I needed to know what time it would be, where you live. In Australia. Uh, for, yeah. <laughs> you're, for your year 17. <laughs> it would be 11 p.m. My seventh grade team oh, meeting good. is at 11 p.m. for you tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <my> back. <laughs> and I don't know um, how many people would have a use for this who are listening to this, but certainly for me, meeting, yeah. with, interviewing, and, and talking to different people from all over, this is, is great because then I can just sort of see where my calendar events line up and where the spaces can are I? as they relate. Can I give you one more, which is yeah. even better, which is actually what I use for my podcast interviews. I use Calendly. Oh, Have you yeah. used that before? I, yeah, so you, you, are, you proactively say what time slots you're available. So like for me, I say, okay, I, I will allow people to make appointment bookings with me from 8 a.m. my time to midday my time or 3 o'clock my time, whatever. I know for me, like people in the States, it's best if it's my morning up to sort of lunchtime. That, that works really well for people in the States. Anything that's late, like 4 or 5 p.m. for me, it's going to be getting too late for you guys. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the middle of the night. So with Calendly, I set up the time slots that I'm available and then I send the link to the person and basically they open it up and it, translates instantly what they are seeing on the screen is in their own time zone and so they can say yes i'm available from uh to 8 p.m till 9 p.m to talk to you which is my 12 p.m i'm very uh good with the eastern est time zone. yeah and they can just click the link to to make the booking so I was using the free version for quite some time just for podcast interview setup, but I've ended up upgrading to the paid version because it allows me to set up different types of appointments, each with their own calendar time slots. So for like members of my community, they can actually uh, book a time with me if they just want to have a one-on-one -on -one chat for 30 minutes. So I have one set up for that. I have a podcast one, which is set to be, I don't know, an hour or 90 minutes long, just in case we need extra time. And yeah, so all these different time slots and different calendars that people can book into. And it just does it all for you. It's so good. So, and also I like it because I am proactively saying when I'm available for you to book with me as opposed to like, right, well, right. When, when works for you or when works for you. Yeah, right. so it works well. How would you say this compares to something like Doodle? Oh, I think I've used that before. This seems much more detailed in terms of how you can tweak the, the setup for yourself, if you know what I mean. And, oh, and you just hook it up to Zoom. So if you go to my Calendly, let's say I was interviewing it next week, if you go to Calendly and book your time, it will automatically, as soon as you hit that submit button, it sends the meeting link to you in an email and, oh, and to me as cool. well. It says, Robbie has booked a time with you for the Music Tech Teacher podcast. Here's the Zoom link. Okay. And then it cool. auto, auto goes into my Google Calendar as well. So everything's there. Yeah, and I have it set because the thing that I found, I actually have notifications turned. This is one of the only apps I have notifications turned on for on my phone. So if someone books an appointment with me, it will pop up on my phone and say, Robbie has booked an appointment with you. Because <laughs> in the past, sometimes I've checked my calendar like the night before and gone, someone's booked in for a podcast interview tomorrow morning. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Mostly not. It's only happened maybe once. But, right. yeah, I realized, oh, my gosh, when, when you allow people to book with you, like you need to just be aware of who's who you've right. given the link right. to, who you're expecting an appointment from. Turn notifications on. <laughs> this lessons. is probably a saner way to set up when I when I do private lessons and I need, do need to do a makeup lesson, like reschedule with someone. Absolutely, I, should... I know a number of music teachers who are doing um, who are using Calendly for that purpose, and because it, it hooks up to Zoom, it, it may hook up to other things. Um, it integrates with a few things, but Zoom was highly attractive to me just to yeah for the podcast particularly. If I set, sign up, so it's offering me to sign up with Google. Will it still allow me to add my iCloud calendar? Yeah, I don't know about that. The one the only thing that this sounds way fancier than Doodle, but the one thing I did like that Doodle would do is it would I could plug in my Outlook, iCloud, and Google Calendar accounts, and then it would look for the free space between those yeah, three accounts. Right. Yeah, and then it, it that would could be my do. available time. I, and I haven't used it like that mainly because I I want to be fairly tailored about the times that I offer. So I don't I never offer my Monday as an option for people to book in. For instance, I I just always want Monday for me. So I 
yeah so even though my calendar might be empty on that day i don't want i don't want people booking on that day. <laughs> so right. yeah right i have set times yeah yeah. But yes, it does a lot of ninja things and uh, features get added often. So I need to look at it again and delve into it a bit more because, you know, features get added and then you realize six months down the track, you have not been using an app in the most efficient way because something updated and you just didn't know. It's like, ah, yeah. yeah, I totally hear that. I, I got to do an honorable mention on the topic of Calzones real quick too. I, sorry, I was scrolling <laughs> down in my outline and I was like, I have to mention. So the guy who makes this app is named David Smith. He is a sing, like a single, have you heard of this guy? Do you like no. follow him on Twitter or anything? No, I don't. He is, because this relates to TikTok. I think you'll find this interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to look him up now. He's, his Twitter handle is underscore David Smith. And he makes tons of apps, small apps that do like one thing and one thing really well. And he made an app called Widget Smith that blew up on tiktok and he yeah. now all of a sudden I, like, I have it because of that <laughs> yeah yeah so w between um widgets now you can like put you know like a calendar widget on your home screen of your phone that will basically show you your next couple events and then it's just you know you don't have to open the calendar app to see them anymore well he made an app where you can customize widgets that go on your home screen which could it could be like the calendar day it is or like a photos so a cycle through photos from one of your favorite albums or like show your steps he like basically created a custom widget builder yeah. and this app went viral because people were using this in combination with in the shortcuts app everything is always comes back around <laughs> you can yeah. basically save a shortcut as an app to your home screen and then make a custom icon for it. Well, yeah. one of the shortcuts you can do is to open an app. So you can make a shortcut called open Twitter and then save that shortcut to your home screen with a custom Twitter icon. So basically you're, you're basically, basically theming your icons on your phone yeah. in combination with these fun widgets. So people are making these like super um, artistic redesigns of their home screen and i just had to mention him because he's like an indie well, app developer success story I, I love it i've been using it and yeah i totally went down that tiktok my it was again my kids fault so i have i'm showing robbie my screen where i've got the blue themed oh, screen yeah. and then i've got like the green and rainbow theme oh, and then i've gosh. got this one which is all reds and yellows and oranges plus his widget which shows a couple of photos which match the color because i'm obsessed with color and making things match but I'm particularly proud of my blue screen. <laughs> but also, basically, all the app icons are blue. But I, I went down that path. I tested out using that shortcut uh, trick and customizing the thing. But I just got annoyed with the time it took when you tap on it to open the app. And I'm like, nah, it's just too. It took too long to launch it. It was. It's quicker just to have the app. Yes. So I went down the color coding theme instead, or Rouge, I should say instead. But yeah, I do use a couple of his widgets. I've got like a, a day and date one, so it's just really plain and clear at the top of the screen. And because sometimes you just need to see that information. Yeah, of course. And I've got like the last Apple, my reminders app, like the the few things for today. And my reminders app shows on another screen. So yeah, it's really good. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. You're a power user. Can I, can I, is there any way I can put your, your beautiful yeah, screen, screen in, my, yeah. Oh, yeah. in the notes for this episode? That would be totally cool. proud of my screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. My boys have it too. My, my 15 year old son, he's, he's got a fantastic black screen. Like, so what happens is when you want to do this, if you want to color code a page of apps, you basically go looking through your phone for all the blue apps. So you've got Twitter, you've got Facebook, you've got whatever else. And the funny thing is I've ended up <laughs> with apps on this page not because I use them a lot, but because they're blue. And you end up also going, oh, I need one more app to like fill the space on this page. And so my son, one of my sons, Josh, he's like, yeah, I went down and I went and downloaded this app specifically because it has a blue icon because I needed to fill up my blue right, icon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, do you use the app? And he's like, no, <laughs> just needed That's it so to fill funny. his page up. So funny. Yeah. Wow. Hilarious. <laughs> I love it. Gosh, yeah, it's yeah. fun. TikTok, it's a lot to answer for. Totally, <laughs> totally. Should we do album? Do you want to move to that? Yeah, or are you... nice. yeah I was, I'm excited about album of the week. It's funny. I'm going first, obviously, but <laughs> Great, just go decided. for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, since I you started using Spotify, whenever I don't know, a few years ago, whatever, um, I have listened to or discovered more new music than ever before in my whole life. Like I just. I, again, I like 
I think a lot of people are fearful of the algorithms of apps that they use, but, you know, I'm loving the TikTok algorithm because right. it feeds me things I want to see. And I'm loving the Spotify algorithm because, again, it, it pop, pops up with things that, hey, you might like this. And I listen every week to my to the two playlists which it makes for you, which is uh, Release Radar and whatever the other one is, which is kind of like stuff you might like. I don't know what mm. they, I can't remember what they call it. And so I listen to both of those and then it helps me, dis- I'll discover weekly. So it helps me discover things that I might not already know or have listened to or artists, or whatever. So two artists that I've discovered because of Spotify, I'm doing two, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is when I'm working, I really need like acoustic music, quite gentle for the most part. And so I listen to this, this band, which just Spotify fed to me, which is called the Arcadian Wild. And, like, who knew this band except Spotify told me about them and so I listen to them all the time and it's the most beautiful music. It's a guitarist and a mandolin player and they sing and they have... There's often a female in there as well. I can't remember their names. There's a female singer as well and she she also plays, I think, violin and then they have other people who sort of join with them on occasion and I just love their music. It's just really beautiful. It's um, acoustic, it's intelligent songwriting. It's beautiful to listen to and it really gets stuck in your head in a good way. So there's that. But then occasionally when I'm working, I really need music that peps me up and (laughs) gets me going like, oh my gosh, wake up and get some work done. So I will listen to usually kind of like funk jazz kind of music things with lots of horn horns in them like horn line and so Corey wong he's a guitarist Ah, actually i love that guy i know right (laughs) so he popped up i knew of him like a little bit but spotify gave me his like one of his albums from last year was um, live in amsterdam Uh so it gave me like the title the, the first track from that album and i was like you know, when you're working and I'm like, I had to stop working and just yeah. listen. <laughs> it was so cool. He's with the Metropole Orchestra and like there's a wicked horn line and a fantastic drummer and like all the things. And so I then I went and listened to, you know, all of his stuff pretty much. Yeah. His and band so Wolfpack was, is wildly popular yeah. with music teachers everywhere. Yeah. Oh, I love I love them. And I didn't make that connection until afterwards. I was like, who is this Corey Wong? Oh, right, right. He plays with them. So... Yeah, so I listen to to him. <laughs> well, you would like then if you if you like acoustic music, he's put out two small records at the beginning of this fall. When is I forget what they're called? Like one of them is trail yeah. Music, I just I saw today. I was looking him up today because of this, and I was like, oh, there's new stuff I haven't listened to of his. So I've got to go back and 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 go back. Yeah, listen to that. There's like a daytime yeah. and a nighttime version, and the daytime one has collaborations with Chris Thiele and Sierra Hull on mandolin and like all sorts of fun. Awesome. Yeah, it's so yeah, good. It's I just like cool. intelligent music, music that makes you think. D- Dirty Loops also falls into this category, and you know, uh, Scary Pockets who do the covers of stuff like just yeah, really cool, they're fantastic stuff. Oh man, yeah, they're love awesome. It. Love it, love it. Cool. All right, tell me yours. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say this is this will from at least from a technological perspective, this will compliment you because one of the things I miss about Spotify is that good algorithm for learning music. One of the things I don't have as an Apple Music subscriber these days is you know their algorithm for musical discovery is pretty bad but you know they're like all in on this idea that we'll curate the music for you which is fine it has its own (laughs) strengths but which is you know it's i miss that feature but one of the good things is that if i like an artist i can usually find like a couple of playlists that the apple music team has curated with you know just that artist's music and apple for all the things i don't like about apple i do believe that somewhere in the company they are still like committed to music they have like a like a core of people who really care and i just feel like i listen to these they're called apple music essentials they're playlists of a particular artist and i and i get the feeling when i listen to these playlists that the people who put these playlists together like really understand what makes that artist tick whether you are a seasoned listener or someone who's just discovered them for the first time because the the song picks are always really a good balance of here's something that was popular by them here's something that was like a b-side Here's yeah. something that isn't popular or, you know, or critically acclaimed, but it's something that like gets at the core of like who they are as musicians. So it's really good. I was listening to that podcast I told you about earlier, The Third Story, and I was listening to the Corey, not the Corey Wong. Corey Wong <laughs> is on that an episode of that show, but the Corey Henry oh, right. episode. Oh. Corey Henry, ah. the or- organ player who's a lot oh, of people yeah. 
know he's one of the keyboardists in the band Snarky Puppy, also widely popular. Yes, I know. I love them too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so There's he's, another he's... Corey as well, I think. Because I was looking, I was thinking Corey, the, the one I wanted to mention, and then I'm like, I got the wrong one at first. And I'm like, no, no, not that Corey, the other Corey. I don't think it was the one you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, Corey Henry is, is great. His, now, his, his album is not my pick, but his recent album that came out a few months ago is really, really quite good. And he was just mentioning like some of his influences growing up in it the is church. Him, yes, he was the one I got mixed up with. I had him. To, I'm like Corey Henry. Oh no, Corey Wong. But yes, I love him okay. too. I've got one of his on uh, high repeat at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Called he's excellent. Yeah. He's he's so, he's yeah. such a fantastic musician. And you know, I've people like him who play on his level. Like you just you never know what to expect when you go into an interview because it's like I don't know. I didn't know what to expect, but he was just like a surprisingly. Like he's known one of his one of the YouTube videos that is popular with him in it is like him at age four playing organ in church, and huh. it's just ridiculous what he's capable of. And I don't know, I just don't always know how to expect people like that to talk about their music making process. But it was just surprisingly relatable to me how he has grown musically. It it wasn't like, you know, it, it's just clear that like as prodigious as he is, like it comes from a place of like hard work and self discovery, just like everyone else however good at organ he was when he was four, you know, <laughs> and he really gets into that and talks about his influences. And one of his influences is, well, a lot of his influences are gospel music. And he he keep, he talks about a lot of like gospel artists and like what gospel sounds like in different States. Like what does Chicago gospel sound like? What does New York gospel sound like? And it's just really interesting. And someone he mentioned who I had heard of before, but who I'd never really taken a dive into is Ty Tribbett, who is just like a, kind of like a Kirk Franklin figure if you're familiar with him it's just like a yeah. like a composer and a choral writer and arranger and just someone who's like in the gospel community like produces and writes a lot of music typically some of his more famous songs like have they're called the great anointing I think they're like a, they're a choir and I was just like kind of excited to dig into this playlist this week even though it's not technically an album but there's just so much you know, I'm a drummer, so you know, I we, we like we like this kind of music because so much of it is like really chop heavy drum set yeah. playing and, and like groove oriented. Yeah. And I just this his music is just pulling from so many genres and ideas. Like there's it'll be like heavy rock one second and ska the next, and then like trap hip hop the next, and then it'll suddenly go into a really traditional like two feel gospel break, <laughs> and you're just sort of hearing it all put together and i don't know and it's also just very very uplifting and energizing music to have on yeah it's good it's what you need yeah yeah that sounds great i'm going to explore that yeah tie tribute <laughs> awesome we should do this again sometime i i'm getting a text from my wife that my son is like where's dad so <laughs> it's like read it's what usually i read to him around this time but, um, and, and usually my dog's like she's she's actually gone to sleep which is a good thing but yes <laughs> we should wind up i'm off to a lunch uh, thing actually shortly so i've kind of written off most of today with doing other things but it's good you know it's nice and it's been great to chat so yes we don't have to do it again are there any other places that people should look for your work online or did we hit them all? No, I just, if they want to connect with me, website's the best place, the, the catch-all for everything really. But um, if they want to follow me on Twitter, I, I am on Twitter quite a bit. Uh, haven't been just for a little while, but I will get back to that as well. And, and Facebook as well, you know, connect with me there. I mean, most of the groups, I don't know, a lot. I'm in a lot of groups. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so you can pretty much always tag me in one of those and, and ask a question or something. So, yeah, so it's always good. Good to connect. Awesome. Very, very cool. Well, I'll link all that. I'm going to go do bedtime, I think. Yes, definitely do that. All right. Great to talk to you. So good to talk to you too. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it so much. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to the blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app of your choice. It absolutely helps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. Learn more about my music and teaching career at robbieburns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. See you next time.